Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this evening's meeting of Woking Borough Council's Planning Committee. When is this the 7th? Uh, 9th? 9th of March 2022. This uh, is a hybrid meeting of the Planning Committee. It's hybrid because some people are present with me here in the David Hicks room and others are participating remotely by using Microsoft Teams. Meetings also being live streamed on YouTube. I'm Councillor Chris Bowering and I chair the meeting. The planning committee, most of whom are, are here in David Hicks room, consists of 11 elected members, borough councillors, and is supported by a variety of officers. There are representatives on the committee from all four political groups on the council. Um, this evening, uh, the officers we have are with me here, Callum Wernham, who's Democratic Electoral Services Specialist and Clerk to the Committee. Online, Chris Easton, Head of Transport, Drainage and Compliance. Mary Severin, Borough Solicitor. Connor Corrigan, Service Manager for Planning and Delivery. And Marcia Head, Head of Development Management. This is a quasi-judicial meeting with formal procedures which must be adhered to. For each application, and clerk to the Committee. Um, I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, Chairman, but um, you mentioned a few moments ago that there are representatives of all four of the groups on the Council. Uh, sadly, that's no longer the case uh, following the resignation of one of our colleagues, Carl Doran. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity uh, to record our thanks to Carl for his service to the committee over several years. He was uh, always incredibly well prepared when he came to this committee. He made some extremely good points. He argued his case very eloquently, but never in an aggressive fashion. And uh, we all know he was a great champion of trying to use the planning system to improve the quantity of social housing we, we were able to secure in the borough. Um, and I'm sure we'd all like to acknowledge his contribution I hope this could be somehow conveyed to him, um, certainly in the minutes, and um, uh, I'm sure we'll all we'll all miss him. Thank you very much, Steve. I can only concur with those sentiments. He was a very effective member of this committee, and he will certainly uh, be missed. I'm sure we can make a note of that, Callum, in the minutes. Now, um, this is a quasi judicial. Got oh, where I was. This is a quasi. <laughs> Quayside Judicial Meeting with formal procedures which must be adhered to. For each application, firstly, the planning officer will present the application. Then only those speakers who have pre-registered to speak will be called to address the committee. No one else, including borough councillors, town and parish councillors, agents, applicants, objectors, supporters, are permitted to address the committee, ask questions, interrupt or disrupt the meeting. But everyone has had a chance to comment on the applications through the normal consultation process. Please note that there is a strict time limit for speakers of three minutes for each of the four categories. That's town and parish councils, objectors, supporters and borough members affected by the application. Members of the committee are more impressed by the quality of what you say rather than how long you speak for. But above all, please stay within your time limit. Following the registered speakers, members of the committee will discuss and debate the application and seek clarification from the council's professional planning officers in order to try to reach a decision. The decision reached by the committee may or may not agree with that recommended by the presenting case officer. Finally, it is the committee's responsibility to determine any valid planning application placed before it using current national and local planning policies and relevant decisions of the independent planning inspectorate. Our role is not to suggest, to suggest alterations to applications nor to consider whether they are a good idea, whether they are needed, whether they are too costly, and if there are alternative uses of the land or site or more suitable uses of land elsewhere. If you are joining us remotely, please ensure your camera is switched on only when you're speaking. And for everyone else, please make sure your microphone is switched on when speaking and off at other times. I also applies to members of the committee, uh, otherwise, people will not be able to hear what you're saying. So please remember to switch your, press your, your button on your microphone. Thank you very much. So we go on to the agenda and the first item is apologies for absence. I believe there are none. 
Um, and with so minutes of the previous meeting, are there any points to be raised, uh, Rebecca? Uh, thank you. Um, I just noted in where I made my declaration of interest, it says that I did sit on the planning committee for the parish council. It should say did not. Thank you. OK, we'll amend that. Any other points? No. Are there any declarations of interest, members? Uh, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Chair. Application 214046, Dane Hill. I am a member of the Early Town Council Planning Committee that, as a consultee, made a recommendation on this application. However, I did not take part in their deliberations. I have not formed a view on this application and am able to and am able to take part in tonight's discussion and vote with an open mind. Thank you, Andrew. Nobody else? Uh, Seem. I'm not entirely sure whether this is appropriate. Mine's a, a, a non-declaration of interest, but for the sake of clarity. Lack of interest. Uh, no, not a lack of interest. Um, <laughs> I, I'm disinterested, but not uninterested. Um, this relates to application 214108, Hare Hat, Sheeplands, Twyford. Um, and there are two points I, I wanted to just make clear. First, um, uh, my son has worked at Hare Hat, Sheeplands. Second, I have been a customer of Hare Hat Sheeplands. I don't think either of these uh, disqualify me from participation in the debate or voting, uh, and I don't propose in any way to withdraw. Uh, my son worked there over 15 years ago, um, and uh, along with many other school leavers from uh, Twyford. And um, uh, the fact that I shopped there or have shopped there I don't think is relevant that I share in common with the whole of the Twyford community, I imagine. Thank you, Stephen. That's fine. Yeah, Bill. Again, I don't, I'm not sure that this is necessarily an interest, but um, in my working life, I was uh, a, a contractor who worked with Sheeplands or worked for Sheeplands, and I haven't done that now for about five years, but uh, I will declare it just, just in case. OK. Thank you. I think that's fine. Anybody else? Anybody else shop there? I think I, I don't think we need to worry about. I don't think we need to worry about that. Okay, let's move on. But a lot to get through. Uh, I didn't believe there are no applications to be deferred and withdrawn this evening, so we move straight on to uh, application uh, one nine two three two five, land southeast of Finchampson Road, South Wokingham, SDL. Uh, on page thirteen of the agenda, and. Emmy Circuit is the case officer. Good evening, Emmy. Over to you. Good evening, Chairman. Thank you. Um, this application is a hybrid application for up to 171 dwellings and will complete the planned development in the South Wokingham Strategic Development location. I'll start the presentation with a brief recap of the planning policy context and the progress with delivery of the STL to date. When the core strategy was adopted in 2010, it established a spatial strategy for the borough for the period up to 2026, and it took the approach of concentrating the majority of new housing in four strategic development locations to allow comprehensive planning of development and delivery of the supporting infrastructure. So policies CP17 and CP21 allocated um, the site at South Wokingham for an urban extension of around two and a half thousand new homes. And those policies are supported by two supplementary planning documents that set out a lot more detail about the vision for a high quality sustainable development with the infrastructure needed to support it. And here you see the framework plan from the SPD that sets out a high level strategy for the development and the application site is outlined, which lies to the west of the site. Now, this is the last part of the planned development at South Wokingham to come before the planning committee. The first phase was um, Montague Park, north of the railway line, um, which was granted outline planning permission 10 years ago now and is approaching completion. It delivered about a quarter of the new homes in the strategic development location, together with its proportionate share of on and off site infrastructure. And that includes William Healers Way, which is the first section of the Southern Distributor Road, um, which will ultimately form a connection from London Road to Finch Hampstead Road. Uh, this was followed by a council application, um, commonly referred to as the Eastern Gateway, 
um, which provides a bridge over the railway line and connects William Healers Way to Waterloo Road and that opened in January this year. Then in um, on the 18th of May last year, the planning committee resolved to approve five further applications which represent the majority of the remainder of the development south of the railway. There were two council applications for the Southern Distributor Road and related offsite mitigation in Finch Hampstead Road. And then a consortium of developers um, had three applications um, for much of the housing. Um, so with the current application, um, this will bring the approved total maximum number of dwellings in the SDL to 2,456, which is in line with the core strategy requirement for around two and a half thousand new homes. Also consistent with the core strategy um, requirement for comprehensive planning and delivery, the developers have been working together um, and the applications are unpinned by a comprehensive approach to the master plan, which I think you can get an impression of um, from this slide here. Um, they're also um, accompanied by an infrastructure delivery plan that sets out all the infrastructure needed to support the development and how it will be secured with each party making their proportionate contribution. And then each application is also accompanied by an environmental impact assessment, which considers the cumulative effect of all the development in the strategic development location and also in the wider area. Now, the report sets out a detailed assessment of the proposals against development plan policies and guidance. Um, and in the remainder of the presentation, I'll just give a very brief overview of that assessment and how the proposals fit in with the remainder of the strategic development location. You can see from the aerial photograph that the site is mainly open paddocks at the moment and that the tree cover is concentrated around the site boundaries and also along the line of the Embrook, which you can see cutting diagonally across the site. Um, it's a hybrid application. Full planning permission is sought for the SANG, um, which you can see in bright green on the plan on the bottom left corner of this slide. And the remainder of the proposals are in outline. So the means of access, appearance, landscaping, layout and scale are all reserved. The outline planning permission will establish the maximum number of dwellings, which is 171, and principles that will then inform the later applications pursuant to reserve matters. And these are the four parameters plans which establish broadly which areas will be developed, where public open space will be located in the development, how it will be connected to its surroundings and the distribution of building heights. The SPD set out five principles for the design of development in the strategic development location, um, which you see here, and I'm going to use them then to structure the rest of the presentation, starting with the landscape framework. Um, and the policy establishes um, that there should be a continuous network of multifunctional open space along the Embrook and its tribu tributaries, incorporating existing landscape features and providing for outdoor recreation in the vicinity of residential areas, as well as supporting biodiversity and incorporating sustainable drainage. This is something that requires coordination and um, this slide is intended just to give an overview of what the SDL as a whole will deliver. Um, because when you take the combined um, applications, there will be two substantial SANGs um, following the line of the Embrook as indicated by policy um, on the Western one. Parks and gardens, allotments, 12 play areas uh, around the um, whole SDL. Provision for sport with a um, all weather pitch at the Montague Park Primary School, which is available for community use outside school hours and then all the developments contributing towards delivery of a sports hub at Gray's Farm adjoining the SDL. There'll also be civic space within the neighbourhood centre, uh, amenity space and natural, semi-natural green space within the residential parcels and green corridors around them. So together, the applications meet the overall requirements for green infrastructure and distribute it well through the strategic development located providing good access for all the proposed dwellings to public open space. And I think they'll all be within um, around 200 metres of the nearest public open space. In terms of what this application itself will deliver, um, there's a, just over eight hectares of SANG focused on the Embrook corridor, which is actually more than double the area required to mitigate this 
application on its own, although it will re rely on the adjacent SANG um, to achieve the necessary minimum walk length. There will also be on-site allotments, uh, a park and garden, and two play areas. Um, so it largely consumes its own smoke, but also makes an appropriate contribution to the overall package of open space for the um, SDL as a whole. The next principle is to do with residential areas and the SPD envisages four neighbourhoods, each with its own distinct character. And the proposals fit with that vision um, with the larger development path or corresponding with the most westerly residential area centred around Chapel Green. And then the two smaller parcels, which would complete the elongated central residential area, which is largely within the second phase of the SDL. In terms of the character of the residential development within the application site, um, this is a provisional master plan and it shows how the residential parcels could be laid out based on the parameters plans and the principles in the design and access statement. In line with the borough design guide and supplementary planning document for South Wokingham, there'd be a traditional layout of perimeter blocks with buildings fronting the streets and good definition of public and private space. And it takes a similar approach to the earlier phases of the SDL and also some of the existing development on London Road and Finch Hampstead Road um, with active frontages onto the um, Southern Distributor Road, but access from within the parcels, which minimises the need for direct accesses onto the road, helping with traffic flow and also the setback helps with residential amenity. And then bottom right um, is the building heights parameters plan, which establishes maximum building heights across the site. And that needs to be read in conjunction with the character areas which are set out in the design and access statement. And I've dotted them on there very roughly in red. So consistent with the expectations of the SPD, um, it's proposed to have more formal, higher density urban residential character development along the SDL corridor um, with building heights varying and going to a maximum of three storey or 12.5 metres to the ridge. And then on the southern parts of the parcels, you've got um, lower density rural interface character areas um, with building heights limited to two storey or 10 metres. And the approach has regard for both the transition from the sort of urban to the more rural area adjoining and also importantly for the setting of the grade one um, listed Lucas Hospital, um, which I've put a star, gold star roughly in the location of that building. Um, what this layout demonstrates is that it will be possible to achieve appropriate separation distances um, between the development and existing properties, including the nearest neighbours in Chapel Green and within the development that garden sizes can be provided in line with the guidance in the borough design guide and that car parking and cycle storage can be provided to the council standards and their approach to delivering them will help to define the different character areas within the development. Um, there will also be a mix of market housing in line with the local housing needs assessment and 35% affordable housing um, with an appropriate mix of um, sizes and tenures in line with the council's policy. So the principles established by the Outline Planning Commission would be elaborated through more detailed master plan and design code and then through reserve matters applications. Um, the fourth principle um, is to do with access and movement and the um, policy requirement is for a continuous network of streets with a legible hierarchy including the Southern Distributor Road, which will provide access to the SDL and integrate it with the existing network, um, as well as having a more strategic function. And as I've mentioned, planning permission for the um, road is already in place. So the vehicular access for the residential parcels within this development um, will be from the Southern Distributor Road. The site constraints mean there's limited opportunities to tie vehicular access into the wider network and the larger parcel is um, expected to have more than 100 dwellings in it so there's a need for a second emergency access and what is proposed um, which you can see dotted at the bottom of the slide um, is to construct the pedestrian and cycle connection with, between that parcel and Luckley Road um, to a specification that would allow very occasional emergency use without detracting from the setting of the Lucas Hospital or the quality of the public open space that it runs through. 
and that link is also an important element of the walking and cycling strategy for the SDL. The Council's Greenway strategy um, is intended to provide a network of pedestrian and cycle routes connecting settlements, including one running from the Arborfield SDL um, through to Wokingham Town Centre, which passes through the South Wokingham site. Um, and so that's the route of the Greenway through the development. Um, and it's intended that it will be a sort of three metre wide route um, using similar surfacing to elsewhere in the Greenway network through public open spaces and with a separate footpath cycleway through the residential parcels, but it will also be on quiet sort of secondary and tertiary routes that um, where cyclists could probably be confident on the highway as well if they wish to. Um, the proposals also include replacement of the existing substandard footbridge over the Embrook on the route of Wokingham footpath 24 and Wokingham without footpath 9 and associated diversions. Those works were approved as part of the um, application for the Southern Distributor Road last year, um, but the funding is to be secured through the infrastructure delivery plan and section 106s for the housing development. The walking and cycling strategy also includes um, links to the west to Finch Hampstead Road via Luckley Road and Tangley Drive and the Southern Distributor Road. And then um, there are also improvements in the Finch Hampstead Road corridor improved funded through a combination of SIL and Section 106 contributions. Um, there's also proposed to be a pedestrian and footpath link through the SANG connecting to a similar route within the Phase 2 SANG and then eastwards through to East Hampstead Road providing an off-road connection um, through the development and actually within phase two, but um, surfacing improvements to footpath 10 are proposed um, to reflect the fact that it'll probably be much more intensively used in future than it is currently. And that brings me to the end of a very brief overview of the assessment, which is set out in detail in the agenda. Um, what I hope it's shown is that this application will complete the delivery of a comprehensively planned development supported by the necessary infrastructure in line with development plan policy and that subject to the detailed design secured through reserve matters and conditions and a legal agreement to secure infrastructure, the application will form part of a high quality sustainable extension to the town of Wokingham and can be supported. There are just a few points to um, bring members attention to in the supplementary agenda. Um, one additional representation has been received from someone who's already commented on the application um, they haven't raised any new planning issues that aren't already captured in the summary of representations and responses in the agenda. Um, there's a correction to paragraph nine, which hadn't been updated um, when the maximum number of dwellings was reduced from 190 to 171. Um, so that slightly reduces the total number of dwellings proposed in the SDL, but doesn't alter the assessment that the proposals are consistent with the requirement for around two and a half thousand new dwellings. Um, just a missing cross-reference in condition three, um, which has been added back in. A slight explanation of condition 20 for any members who are wondering about that. And then uh, an additional condition um, arising from some discussions with Thames Water and an informative to go with that. Other than that, the recommendation is for conditional approval subject to a legal agreement as set out in the agenda. Thank you, Emmy. We have two speakers on this application. First of all, Fitzroy Morrissey, who is a resident. Mr. Morrissey, I think you're here. Good evening. You have three minutes. Thank you. I'd like to speak about the flood risk associated with this development, which I believe has not been adequately taken into account. The area immediately to the south of the development, which includes my own property in Chapel Green, has seen considerable flooding over the last few years. Our driveway and garage were continuously flooded between January and March of last year, and the situation was so bad that we had to call in the fire brigade. This is the photo up there. Nor is this the problem that only affects our property. The tributary of the Embrook, which runs along the western flank of the proposed development site, regularly floods. The ditch at the side of Luckley Road, through which the tributary runs, is constantly waterlogged, this is the second slide. And the railway bridge at the, uh, the road under the railway bridge at the end of Luckley Road likewise often becomes badly flooded during the winter months. As do a number of properties on Luckley Road and Luckley Wood, as several residents have asked me to mention. 
This situation has got considerably worse in recent years as a result in the rise in the water table due to climate change. What is particularly concerning is that the plans for the development do not take the risk of increased flooding to this area into account. The latest version of the flood risk assessment concludes that there will be no increase in flood risk to neighbouring properties as a result of this development. However, this conclusion is based on an assessment of the likely flooding of the Embrook itself and doesn't take in the, into account the risks associated with the flooding of the tributary. According to the flood risk assessment document, no flood risk measurement nodes were allocated to this stream. As you can see from the photos I've shown, the flooding situation is already dangerous and unsustainable, and it's worsening with climate change. When the new development is added to the mix, I'm concerned that the area will be constantly under the threat of inundation unless much more serious flooding mitigation measures are put in place. We are already suffering badly from flooding and simply seeking to maintain the status quo is not sufficient. I also want to say something about parking. I'm concerned that some users of the proposed sang and allotments are likely to access the area via the emergency access point on Luckley Road and will park in the area that I've just been speaking about. This area is not suitable for parking and has already become extremely congested with traffic and parked cars in recent years due to increased recreational use of Lug Grove Drive and Gorick Wood. And you can see this from the photo. This has caused considerable damage to the road and the verges, as well as considerable pollution. And more traffic will only worsen the situation. I would therefore ask that measures be taken to prevent users of the Sangin allotments from parking their cars on Luckley Road. <coughs> Finally, to come back to the issue of flooding, I've been asked by Richard Benning of One Chapel Green Cottage to note that the proposed Sang area at the bottom of his garden continuously floods, turning the area into a lake and making it impossible to use at certain times of year. As a result, Richard believes that the Sang will not be a suitable recreational year, uh, area for much of the year. Thanks, and I hope you will take these points into account when making a decision on the application. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, secondly, Laura Jackson, who is the agent. Good evening. Um, uh, Laura is a uh, virtual, I think. Hope she's there. Good evening, councillors, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a senior planning manager for Persimmon Homes, and uh, I am speaking on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I have been working closely with your officers to ensure that the development proposals that are before you this evening are acceptable in planning and design terms. As has been made clear in the officer's presentation and um, committee report, the principle of development is established by the site's location in one of the borough's strategic development locations, which is a designated planned urban extension required to deliver much needed housing in the borough. Importantly, our proposed development will ensure that all the land required to deliver the new South Wokingham Distributor Road comes forward. It will also make its fair and reasonable costs via civil and section 106 obligations to the funding and delivery of the Distributor Road and wider off-site highway improvements. Our proposals will therefore facilitate the delivery of a much needed planned sustainable travel corridor. As explained by your officers, the application is a hybrid one with details for the on-site SANG, which will connect up to wider SANG provision in the development application being in full and matters relating to the residential element in outline. Notwithstanding the outline element, we have sought to provide a detailed provisional layout and technical documentation which demonstrates compliance with all development management policy requirements. As such, a compliant housing mix, including 35% affordable housing, can be provided, along with adequate car parking, garden sizes, pedestrian cycle movement corridors and open space. A safe and attractive environment will be created by the proposed development, allowing a new community to establish and thrive. Important existing landscape features are retained and accommodated, including distinctive hedgerows and trees and the Embrook. Full consideration has also been given to the flora and fauna species that exist on site. Important habitats are retained as part of the open space elements and mitigation of protected species will be provided for. In addition, at least 10% biodiversity net gain can be achieved. We have also de demonstrated that the site can be appropriately developed without increasing flood risk on the site or elsewhere, and suitable on-site surface water and foul drainage solutions can and will be provided with the future reserve matter applications. Overall, it has been demonstrated that there are no adverse impacts that would demonstrably outweigh the significant benefits of the proposals. The proposals therefore constitute sustainable development. These are all relevant considerations when engaging the planning balance which is needed when determining planning applications. 
the MPPF makes it clear that in order to achieve sustainable development, there are three objectives which must be pursued, economic, social, and environmental. And the information submitted with the plan application and summarised in your planning officer's report demonstrates that all three of these objectives are achieved with the proposed development. As such, I urge, your of I urge you to support your officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just said there were two speakers, there were three speakers, so apologies to Councillor Peter Dennis, uh, Borough Councillor for Westcote Ward. Good evening. He's virtual. There we go. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll jump straight into it. Um, Working on Town Council have the following okay. comments and uh, objections to this plan. The Greenway proposed through this development does not separate cyclists from pedestrians and so is essentially discouraging one or both of those forms of sustainable transport. Lack of kickabout space for older children, acknowledged in land for southeast of Finchampstead Road cool. Green Infrastructure Strategy, page 24, section 6.3. Uh, reference to the earlier comment about the um, pitch at Montague Park, this, that is not a free access one, that's a key coded one. Uh, lack of adult exercise equipment, which residents have asked the Town Council for in other sites. Uh, the removal of a group of trees in the middle to build a few houses. It would be best to leave those trees and incidentally protect the external view from the existing cottages. While that is not a planning consideration, the views of the site are mentioned in several places within the documentation. Use Google Maps to see the top-down view of the trees to be removed. The existing public footpath th through essentially countryside is now going to become a walk through an estate with the resultant loss of public amenity. Linked to the above is the access point near the railway bridge. The roadside there needs to be protected from cars parking, suggests wooden posts at regular interviews along Lockley Road to protect the verges and neighbouring land. The Sang is on a floodplain and so will be a walk through mud. This is really a dubious marking of land, makes something that is, cannot be built upon as a Sang for dog walking. Why not make the area that will not be flooded the Sang and leave the floodplain alone? The bicycle storage associated with is part of the bin store and not near the flats. This is discour discouraging for the safekeeping of bicycles for people to cycle. It should be near, nearer to the flats. There is no community centre, local shop leading to the need to travel. The allotments, why are they so far from the properties, the flats that might want to use them? The housing have garden space. One very large concern is that of flooding. This area floods. The Environmental Agency requested additional documentation to ensure that things are adequate. Are they? Climate change is here and it is going to get worse. This falls under CP1, 4, 4 and 9. This site will lead to extra traffic and no doubt not all of it will use the new SDWR, but instead travel along the overused Finchampstead Road with the associated pollution and impact on the local school children. The site has three areas of ecological value and each of these areas are going to be impacted by this plan. The Environment Agency second objection is about the impact on the ecology of the site, but there appears to be no reply to their point. There appears to be no account of the comments made recommending in-channel enhancements, such as the installation of a large woody material, introduction of gravel for fish and invertebrates, removal of any weirs or other barriers and bank reprofiling. Aside, there are errors in the documentation. For example, Land South of Feed Chapstead Road, documentation page 32, 8.19 states, figure 12 indicates TPNOs. It does not. This is concerning, especially when we need to consider the impact. If the committee is minded to approve this application, please consider the following points. Protection of the trees in the middle. Protection of the roadside verges on Luckley Road. Ecological protection enhancement to the Embrook. Consideration of the impact of flooding downstream outside of this site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Amy, <coughs> would you be able to um, come back on some of those things? <coughs> Sorry, coming back to um, Mr. Morrissey, was concerned about flooding in um, um, in Chapel, Chapel Green. Chapel Green, yes. Um, could, could you comment on that, please? There are several different areas he was concerned about. Yeah, um, I think it's difficult to comment on that area specifically. Um, the flooding for the site and for the wider SDL has been looked at um, because it is one sort of integrated drainage system. Um, I think the most significant impact in terms of drainage is probably the construction of the Southern Distributor Road and the applicants there were required to do extensive modelling work um, which was agreed with the Environment Agency to look at the pre and post development um, flood maps. 
and um, that's been agreed and um, ultimately the environment agency's maps will be updated to reflect that but that's a separate sort of procedural um, issue um, so that has been agreed and then the flood risk assessments that support all of the applications for housing development have been based on that modelling work that's taken place which looks at the whole network not just the Embrook but its tributaries as well um, and the policy requirement and what the um, flood risk assessments look at is maintaining or improving on greenfield rates taking an appropriate allowance for climate change um, and certainly the overall um, outcome from the SDR modelling was that um, downstream flooding was likely to be better rather than worse as a result of the development because of the um, flood mitigation and suds that will be delivered. Certainly the council's drainage officer is satisfied um, that uh, flooding will be made no worse and meets the policy requirements um, and it's true the Environment Agency had um, asked for additional information which has been provided it's with them. They haven't been able to come back to us um, before the committee because of their sort of workloads at the moment. Um, but we anticipate that that will address their outstanding questions um, and that we the draft conditions are based on the previous experience in the SDL and also the recommendation um, allows for the assistant director to add any additional conditions if required as a result of the um, Environment Agency's um, forthcoming comments. Thank you, Emmy. And um, Mr. Morris, you also mentioned the parking at the uh, on uh, Luckley Road. I think um, people parking there uh, for the allotments, which wouldn't be, um, did not consider that a good idea. Yes, I think. I mean, it's clearly um, an existing issue there, um, and I think it's a good point that you wouldn't want people parking obstructing the emergency access. And I think the um, whole area around there could be looked at and perhaps posts installed or something suggested um, as part of the condition to look at the detailed design of the emergency access. Okay, and then Councillor Dennis raised uh, rather a lot of uh, points rather quickly. <laughs> um, were you able to pick some of those, try to make a note of them, but there's quite a lot of them. Are there any general uh, comments you can make on the points you raised? I think, yes. I mean, I think... Um, the tree issue, um, we the application is accompanied by um, an assessment, as you would expect, which has been reviewed by the landscape officer. Um, there is, you know, for a development of this size, there are relatively few trees proposed to be removed, and those that are to be removed are not high quality trees or they haven't got a long lifespan. So the landscape officer um, is happy with that and the amount of replacement planting that would take place within the SANG in particular, but elsewhere on the development, would more than compensate for the number of trees that would be um, lost and the landscape strategy for the site would um, reinforce what is retained. The um, comment about cycle stores and bin stores, I think that is a matter for reserve matters and we would need to ensure that they were appropriately located at that stage. Uh, the allotments, um, I think there is a suitable distribution across the SDL as a whole, and they're probably within about 400 metres of, or probably less actually, of any um, dwelling within this application site. The comment about the kickabout space, there is a multi-use games area proposed within phase two of the development, um, and our green infrastructure officer has liaised quite closely with the developers to ensure that the distribution of different types of play areas through the development um, is appropriate. And I think because that sort of play area is aimed at a slightly older age group, um, it's appropriate that it has a slightly larger catchment area and you wouldn't require them sort of so frequently through the development. Um, I think the comment about the environment agency and um, ecology um, what they'd actually asked for was more information about the biodiversity net gain assessment, um, which has now been provided. And that is one aspect of assessment of ecology. Um, but what that is requiring is that there's actually a, a benefit in ecological terms across the development. Um, and the measures that are proposed um, through the 
landscaping of the open space and also within the residential parcels um, will achieve that. And certainly we're waiting to hear from the Environment Agency, but the um, Council of Ecologists has reviewed that and is happy with that. Um, I think there was also a comment about the specification for the paths for the Greenway. Now, the Greenway strategy actually sets out a specification for paths, um, which is appropriate for that type of provision, bearing in mind that they're paths that are in, um, you know, to a large extent in relatively remote locations rather than busy town centres and the level of use that's likely to occur um, and the specification that's appropriate for them and the proposals within this development fit within that specification which is in the council's um, green waste adopted green waste strategy. I think that's most of the ones I've noted down there's probably a few I've missed as well though. OK, that's uh, quite a lot to be getting on with. Um, so, uh, members, I'll come to Angus first as local member. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, my apologies. Some of the questions I probably could have raised with the officers earlier, but I've been away almost the whole time since the agenda went out. Um, I know the area well in my ward. Um, I understand a lot of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, I think we all have to accept the principle of this. It's just a pity that this application didn't come along with all the others. And if we think it's 12 years since the local plan came out, but uh, here we are. A um, couple of points and then some questions. Um, first, I'm pleased on this occasion to see that it says up to 171 dwellings rather than a vague around figure, which we then have to uh, challenge later on. Um, the uh, and, and the other thing is that uh, the, the SANGs are linked with the SANG for phase two, which, which gives some continuity of green space. Uh, and just one comment uh, relating to the Greenway. Um, I think we've all begun to accept that recreation and moving around requires us now to accept uh, that pedestrians and cyclists do have to share space. And in the first Greenway down in Finchampstead, it seems to be working well enough. I know some people are concerned about it, but I think um, there obviously is not enough space to provide separate areas. Um, on the points that Mr. Morrissey raised, uh, I think I, I see, uh, and this is mainly not in my ward, uh, the part of the road that's adopted west of the railway line um, is an issue east of it going towards Ludgrove School it is I think a private road and therefore maybe some comment that I think we're very limited in what we can do there um, and we have to accept it is the one of the main access roads to Ludgrove School. Um, point was raised about the Environment Agency and um, I'm just a little concerned that after all this time we've got to a stage where we're still not having that holding objection withdrawn by them, both on the grounds of um, some of the flooding and the ecology. And, and I'd like an officer comment on how concerned we should be uh, if we were to approve this application, that this is still outstanding and whether there's any backdrop or backstop to that. Um, something that I know uh, Connor and Chris Easton will recognise, I will raise again, in parcel C2, there's a little dot, dot, dot area into land, which is access to Knoll Farm. And at the moment, access to that farm next to the railway is from Gypsy Lane across um, a level crossing on the railway, which causes at least one or two minute delay to all the trains going to London. It's costing Network Rail or Southwest Railway money. And I just wonder whether it would be appropriate to at least have an informative um, that when the reserve matters comes, it's absolutely clear that there will be access into that land from Parcel C2 were that to be developed with the, with the uh, object of then being able to close that very unfortunate crossing of the railway line, which is seen by 
network rail as a safety hazard. I've got some other points, but perhaps I'll just stop there, Chairman, and get those and then come back with a couple more. Would you like to uh, comment on Angus's points, please? Yes, I think if I start with the Environment Agency, I think I mean I think the reason we haven't heard back from them is just because they have resourcing issues at the moment. So um, I think that's that's part of why we've kind of pushed on without having heard from them. Um, but I think the likelihood is that their issues will be resolved. They may well recommend some additional conditions. Although, as I say, we've we've kind of based what we drafted on their previous advice. I think if they did still have issues, I think the first step would be to go back to the applicant and ask for further amendments. Um, and if that wasn't fruitful, then we would probably need to bring the application back to the planning committee if there was something fundamental still outstanding. Um, on the access to Knoll Farm, um, I think that's something the um, applicant is aware of. And actually in the um, draft heads of terms in the report, um, we have included securing the land up to the boundary there. I think the most we can expect the applicant to do is to sort of facilitate a future access being provided on the land at Knoll Farm to enable the um, network rail to close the um, crossing there. Um, but that would be secured through the Section 106. Uh, thank you, Chairman. If I might just go on. Uh, thanks for those points. Um, is the development dependent on the South Workingham Distributor Road reaching that point uh, before any housing can be um, occupied um, because different uh, developers. Um, and um, just one question on maybe a slightly less important item to most, and that's the art condition seven. Sounds a good idea. But um, how far can anybody control what cost that might raise and who decides what's good value, good art or, or where it might be placed? It seems a very vague condition for this. Um, and the last point, um, I'm pleased to see the Ramblers have, have engaged with this over the footpath network. Um, and there's a comment that footpaths, when they reach a sang, needn't be designated. But it, it would seem to me, and it's a point I've made at other places at other times, it would be good to designate footpaths through the sang for clarity to walkers that might come from other areas and not realise what status this green bit between two bits of footpath might be. Um, so yes, I think those, those are the points I've got, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. Over to you again. Um, thank you. I think in terms of the opening of the road, um, the phasing condition, um, which is condition three, um, requires a sort of the, the sequence of things to be set out. Um, so that would address that. And then also there's a condition recommended, um, which is sort of consistent with what we've put on the other um, applications for phase two, um, which requires modelling to be done to demonstrate that any dwellings that are delivered before the completion of the SDR um, can be delivered without an unacceptable impact on the network. Um, and I think the other thing to remember in terms of the road is, of course, that it is being delivered by the council. So that is something that's in the council's control. Um, I think the public art, um, it's something there is a sort of requirement in the policy and guidance for public art. I think clearly getting involved in the assessment of the merits of it probably isn't something for the um, planning process, but we can secure it um, and would, you know, I think liaise with appropriate um, arts bodies like the Wokingham, the name's gone out of my head, but um, about about what was being delivered within the strategic development locations and the conditions we've recommended again are the same as for phase two. I think also it's worth mentioning that we have actually got three pieces of art already developed, delivered in South Wokingham um, in the Montague Park development, which seem to have been quite well received. Um, I think in terms of the public rights of way and designation of them through the 
um, SANGs, that isn't something that we've seen as necessary because the SANGs are being transferred to the council in perpetuity anyway. Um, so it hasn't been seen as necessary because I think the purpose of designating is to kind of secure the um, long term use of them. Um, I think that's something I don't think it's a matter for the planning application, but I'm sure the public rights of way officer could um, look at that and consider it if need be in future. I think I think Angus was trying to get the uh, it signed so that you knew when you were in the sack that you're still on the footpath. Oh, I th yeah. I mean, I think the landscaping condition requires details of um, things like signage, and certainly, I'm sure that would be possible. Okay, thank you. Um, right, members. Um, I've got Stephen and Rochelle. Stephen first, um, and Andrew. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Initially, my my concern when I looked at the agenda was the, um, the setting of the listed building, Lucas Hospital, um, which is going to be wrapped around at least on three sides by the site. Um, but I am um, perhaps somewhat less concerned about that than I was because it's clear that the, the closest bits of the development site are actually going to be green space or allotment. Um, so I think uh, I, I've been reassured by the report uh, on that point, and, and I'd, I'd like to thank Emmy for a very detailed report and also for a very um, impressive summary of, of, of the issues this evening. Um, however, I, I am still concerned uh, about the point that Mr Morrissey raised about uh, flood risk, um, notwithstanding the, um, the, uh, the point about that's been made uh, about the uh, environment agency's holding objection. Um, you, Emmy's able to offer some reassurance on that, but I, I really do have some concerns about the whole methodology when it comes to assessing flood risk. Uh, if I recall correctly, the council's own strategic uh, flood or risk assessment um, of 2020, which is regularly updated, um, I think it's on page 70, makes it clear that uh, site-specific um, flood risk assessments drawn up by applicants uh, will be based on um, essentially historic data provided by uh, environment agency maps. Uh, there's some allowance now required for climate change. Uh, I'm not at all clear whether that uh, allowance is sufficient, but that it, we're starting from a kind of historic base, which is already out of date. <laughs> that is a fundamental problem. Um, the flood risk is increasing all the time, and it's increasing not simply because of climate change, but also because of current uh, and existing development, increasing runoff. And I, I'm not at all convinced we're kind of starting from the right point. We're starting with old data and then trying to compensate for that with um, allowances made. And it's not clear to me that those allowances are sufficient and we've got kind of robust protection against the risk of flood. Um, obviously, I'm not a professional. I can't uh, take this very far. But I really do have a lot of concerns about flood risk, not simply on this site, but on, on lots of sites that the council has or is proposing to develop. It is um, uh, it's true that it is difficult to argue over flooding generally, isn't it? Because it's against experts, as you said, Steve. Um, uh, but the, the fundamental principle is that, that we have to ensure that this is not making things work worse. It doesn't need to solve existing problems. But you raised the points about this climate change being taken to consideration properly. And is the data out of date? Could you comment on that, Emmy? Yes, I think, I mean, it's right. It is a very technical area. Um, but I think in this case, actually, we're in a rather more comfortable position um, than average, perhaps, because of the modelling work that was done to support the SDR application. Um, because rather than just taking the historic situation, they have modelled what the situation is expected to be like in future, taking into account the construction of the road. So we've actually got a sort of more up-to-date picture of what we're working with. Um, and then the modelling then 
that the individual, well, the road application and the subsequent housing applications have done takes into account climate change. And in actual fact, the Environment Agency are currently reviewing um, climate change allowances. And if anything, the allowances for this area might be going to go down rather than up. So I think, again, that's quite a precautionary approach um, at the moment in that we're still looking at the higher climate change allowances. And also, you know, the requirement that they need to demonstrate through their flood risk assessment is that runoff wouldn't be increased as a result of the development. And actually within the, um, well, along the road, within the residential parcels and within the open spaces, there are quite a few um, drainage basins proposed um, that would help manage that. And there's quite a um, developed and integrated drainage strategy for the whole SDL of how those ponds and um, sub features would work, which has been reviewed by the council's drainage team and they are satisfied that it meets our policy requirements and wouldn't exacerbate any um, flooding issues and would in fact be more likely to improve the existing situation. Do you want to come back, Stephen? Um, well, it's, it's very difficult to obviously as a lay person uh, be able to challenge any of this technical advice. And, and what Emmy said is, is is very persuasive on lots of levels, uh, but I'm afraid I do remain somewhat sceptical and concerned. Uh, and obviously, taking account of the Southern Distributor Road is is important, uh, but I'm also concerned about um, upcoming development as well as current development or past development, all of which could have an impact um, uh, beyond this site as well as on it. So I I I, I understand. The technical advice is, is uh, pointing very clearly in, in the direction of this being acceptable, uh, but I, I can't help but remain worried. Thank you, Rochelle. I have, I have several questions. Uh, will the affordable housing all be built on site? Uh, will the suds be, some of the suds be wet at all times? Uh, supposedly suds are supposed to be dry normally. However, in experience so far in some of the present developments, at least a few of them are still wet, providing more mosquitoes and other kind of insect problems. Um, in the, you're replanting trees for the ones you've not, you've taken down. Will it be the same tree cover equivalent uh, because you're putting in much smaller trees, so you're going to put up a whole lot more trees to uh, make up for the larger trees you're replacing. Um, in the development itself, will street trees be maintained? That is one of the problems we're having in the present new estates that we have around the area where they were put in and they were told, the residents were told, you have to water them, you have to maintain them, and it's all on your water meter, not on anybody else's. And the end result was a lot of the trees died. Uh, that also goes for the trees that you're replacing them with. Um, in a few places, we've seen trees where 80% of the trees that were planted died due to uh, drought conditions in one year and were never replaced. Um, lastly, um, I realize we can't make the flooding any better in any place, but what will happen if as a result of all this, even in spite of the fact that they claim there'll be no worsening of the flooding, how will the residents actually fix the flooding problems, including the gentleman over here, if it does get worse? Is he going to have to sue the council, the developer, or whomever to uh, actually get the problem solved and actually fixed permanently? And hopefully the residents will be told that, uh, that WBC will not be maintaining most of the roads if they're not adopted by WBC and everything else. Uh, so far, salespeople have told uh, residents in most of the newest states, oh, it'll be marvelous and everything like this. And then when a light street lamp goes out, they call their council and are saying, we don't have anything to do with it because it's not our street. Um, can we make sure that they're actually told that this will be maintained by their maintenance company, not by the council? Okay, Emmy. Sorry, a number of questions. Um, the affordable housing, um, it's proposed to be 35% all on site. And if that would change, that would be something that would need to come back to the planning committee. Um, in terms of the suds, um, in fact, it depends on the design of the feature, whether it should be wet, dry or um, sort of something, you know, occasionally wet. Um, that is very much how they're designed and how they're intended to be. Um, some of them are one, some of the other. And in fact, 
the ecologist has even been encouraging um, to get a mixture of wet and dry features because of the benefits for wildlife and ecology um, from the wet features. And also there's an amenity benefit, I think, when you look at the kind of quality variety of habitats within public open space, um, having those different sorts of habitats and environments is a benefit. Um, for the replanting of um, trees, I think the number of trees that will be planted within the um, development will significantly outnumber the, those to be re removed. So even accounting for the fact that they will take um, some years to establish and gain the same sort of stature, um, there will be um, sort of more replanting than removal. Um, street tree maintenance, um, I mean, it should be carried out by the developers until the area of the trees are planted in, be it the adopted highway or public open space, is transferred to the council when it would be transferred with a commuted sum for maintenance. Um, and I would mention we have actually tried to reinforce the landscaping condition, um, building on experience elsewhere to try to um, reinforce the need for ongoing monitoring of planting as it becomes established and replacements um, where things do fail. And then I think Chris Easton would like to come in on the um, flooding point. Evening. Um, sorry, I, I messaged but I wasn't realised I was going to call in on that. But um, so, yeah, it was really just to kind of pick up. You are, I think you've all touched on the points that have been raised and uh, that as Emmy has set out. So in terms of flooding, I think that's the biggest thing is that it, it's identified not to make it any worse. So obviously in terms of the water, the, the discharge rates from the site are identified and there is a climate change allowance. So there's uh, one in 100 uh, storm events are identified plus uh, 40 up to 70 percent allowance for climate change. Uh, and that will be required uh, and is set out to be achieved on the site. Uh, so therefore, the the what will leave this portion of the site will not make anywhere worse than what it already is. Uh, and uh, Amy's already touched on all the suds. Uh, and I think in terms of the reserve matters are coming forward. So even when things uh, like the drainage ponds and stuff on site, those features can obviously be uh, reviewed as well at that point again, as those parcels come through. But typically uh, it, it is a pretty sound here and all the guidance that the teams work to are in accordance with the EA guidance that, that we've all been working to and have been the same across all the sites and the drainage as part of this scheme is is not really any different to the scheme that was here before you for the South Oakland Distributor Road um, and all those works that will happen around the Tesco's uh, roundabout and junction and those properties that the, per the council has purchased there to deliver that mitigation. So I hope that just helps provide a little bit more input there. But if it does get worse, who's responsible? Well, if it does get worse, we need to understand what the what what's caused that. I mean, obviously, if it's if it's just uh, climate change itself, then obviously that's not an aspect for the development here at the time of this scheme being approved and assessed. It's complying with the requirements put out by the EA. I mean, unfortunately, we, we none of us can tell where climate change is going in the future, but obviously that's why the EA provide those guidance that and those levels that the the um, the designers have to work to. And lastly, replacement of the trees that die. Uh, will that be done automatically or will it have to be a borough council who has to come up and yell at somebody to do that? Um, that's what I was referring to where we've um, sort of made the landscaping a little bit more condition a bit more robust. We've actually asked that an annual audit of the landscaping is submitted during the time that the um, developers are still maintaining the site so that we can sort of check up on it and, and keep an eye on that without needing to go out on site and be checking ourselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Amy, for your report. Um, I acknowledge everything that uh, the officers have said about um, uh, about flooding um, and um, uh, but do have a lot of sympathy, um, you know, with Mr. Morrissey, um, who, uh, his family is already experiencing um, uh, flooding. I would like to probe another aspect of this, though, and that is the assertion by Councillor uh, Dennis um, that um, uh, he believes that a large part of the Sang uh, may be subject to to flooding. Um, I wonder if officers could comment on that, um, uh, as we do 
as I think some of us know, have sayings in some parts of the borough that uh, have experienced um, flooding to such an extent that they are unusable um, um, uh, for lengthy periods, or have been unusable for lengthy periods of time. Um, I'd like to probe a couple of other uh, points, though. Um, the first being um, to do with traffic. Um, could officers please talk us through the impacts that this development is likely to have on traffic, including journey times along Finch Hampstead Road, what mitigation measures are being proposed, and whether there'll be any measures to improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists along Finch Hampstead Road before any of the proposed homes are occupied. Um, there has been some discussion uh, tonight um, about uh, phasing um, of the distributor road. I won't go over uh, that again, um, but there is a reference also, I think, to uh, some road bridge widening. And I'm wondering um, if we could uh, get a comment on whether that can be assured um, you know, again before um, uh, first occupancy. Um, there is a reference to civic space and the this specifically refers, I believe, to um, uh, civic space in Montague Park. What facilities are there in Montague Park now or will be in future? Um, and are they close enough to attract pedestrians and cyclists from the pro proposed new development? Or um, would we expect um, uh, residents in the new development, perhaps to be making use of facilities somewhere else, you know, perhaps in Wokingham Town Centre. I don't know. My question, though, really is, you know, about accessibility, particularly um, uh, for pedestrians and and cyclists to uh, to civic space. Um, and a third um, area that I'd like to probe um, is that there are. Um, uh, references, a number of references indeed to paths and also to a new footbridge over the Embrook. Um, I don't know whether this is um, uh, an appropriate question to ask at this outline planning stage, or whether it's more reserved matters, but um, could, could we have a comment you know, about whether the intention would be, the hope would be that the services, surfaces and access to the bridge and any gates would be fully accessible to wheelchair users, mobility scooters, uh, push chairs. Um, and the third, the final uh, sort of area, um, which um, uh, I would uh, 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 welcome, um, you know, some guidance, um, is to do with the three-storey, the proposed three-storey, 16-metre-high buildings, which I believe are uh, proposed to be located along the main roadways. Now, my recollection understanding is that quite often um, in developments of this size um, that the tallest buildings have often been um, uh, located uh, towards the centre you know, of the development so that they are in a sense um, shielded from, um, uh, from roadways and uh, that there's a kind of a gradual um, transition. Um, in, in building heights, you know, from the road, uh, from the major roadways, um, you know, looking in towards the uh, the development. Um, I believe that's quite important, you know, and, and, and could be quite effective, you know, in helping to um, um, uh, to um, uh, soften, um, you know, what could otherwise be a very stark contrast, you know, between housing and um, the, in, the, in this case, uh, surrounding rural land. So just a question, you know, about the rationale in this instance um, uh, of um, locating or proposing to locate um, the tallest buildings, 16 metres high, I believe, um, you know, along main roadways. Thank you. A few things there, Amy. Thank you. Um, I think I'll leave the um, traffic one till last because Chris Easton might want to come in on that as well. But if I deal with the other ones first. Um, the question of sang and flooding, I think um, the policy and guidance establishes the expectation that the network of green infrastructure will follow the route of the Embrook. Um, and it's understood in, in saying that, that it is a floodplain, um, so it will flood on occasions. Um, but it's also the case that waterside environments are very attractive for recreation. And there is a balance to be had there of letting the river um, sort of function as it should 
and providing for amenity. And this is something that we've been very much conscious of in the um, design of the SANG um, and that we've challenged the developers on. And what's been looked at with the drainage officer is the areas that are most liable to flooding um, where the footpath network runs within them. And actually um, an alternative route, because the, the route over the footbridge might flood occasionally and um, particularly bad rain events um, but there's an alternative route that goes up onto the southern distributor road embankments along the southern distributor road a little way and then into the northern residential parcel so on those sort of relatively rare occasions there will be an alternative route um, for people walking on that public footpath network. The civic space um, actually it's a sort of the nature of it is kind of like a small public square associated with the neighbourhood centre, so with the retail provision and the um, school. Um, and so, in actual fact, there's one already um, being delivered in Montague Park, which is the sort of hard surfaced area um, adjacent to where the community facility is going to be there. So, sort of where the um, route from the school and the the parking in front of the shops um, converge but then there's proposed to be a similar space within the second neighbourhood centre in phase 2a so close to the junction just to the west of the junction with East Hampstead Road so there will be um, a second neighbourhood centre with um, an area of civic space within it um, in the area south of the um, railway and um, the council is absolutely right as well that the site is quite close to the town centre and you've got the marketplace and other spaces within the town centre. Um, so a variety of sort of accessible spaces of, of that kind. Um, and then in terms of the footbridge um, and the replacement footbridge and the footpath leading to it, um, it has been designed to be suitable um, and accessible with ramps um, up to it that are at an accessible gradient. And the conditions and 106s for the application um, also require upgrading of the surfaces of those paths um, to be um, the, the ones that are within the Greenway network, a flexi pave or equivalent surface, which again is quite a good surface um, and suitable for use by people with um, scooters and buggies and things like that. Um, I think there is clearly you need a variety of paths within the wider sang not all of which would be accessible um, but the main ones would be proposed to be um, and then i think finally um, if i turn to the traffic impacts and um, the modeling that's been done to support the application really looks at that um, the sdr um, has an impact of um, redistributing traffic um, as well as sort of providing a new route so you know in some locations there are actually reductions in the amount of traffic forecast rather than um, increases although clearly um, you know Finch Hampstead Road isn't one of those locations there are a number of off-site mitigation measures proposed at different locations in the borough um, secured by conditions in the 106 um, and I think the phasing um, partly depends on the phasing of development because clearly where the housing is rolled out first will alter where the off-site measures are needed um, and I mentioned earlier there's a condition which requires some modelling um, before to establish how many houses might be occupied before the complete SDR is delivered. Um, and similarly, um, there's a condition securing a number of off-site pedestrian and cycle um, measure improvements to make walking and cycling to destinations, um, including the town centre and actually other destinations like going out um, east towards Bracknell, although it's not so relevant to this application. And again, um, delivery um, likely to be sort of phased through the development according to where the housing is being delivered first. I don't know if Chris wants to add anything more to that or not. No, I think uh, I think you pretty much covered that. Actually, I mean, I was only going to say um, yes that you know at the previous committees that we've been to for the, both the South Oak and Distributor Road and the wider housing parcels, the applications and the modelling, uh, sorry, the transport assessments and the modelling have basically been the same for each. And it's been a copy and paste because we wouldn't allow for one development just to assess its own impact. You have to assess the full picture, and all those infrastructure mitigations that Amy's mentioned are secured in an IDP. And will be linked to the 106 that are to be shared and delivered amongst um, whichever parcels decide to come first to ensure 
that mitigation is covered. Yes, thank you very much, uh, you know, for those very, very comprehensive answers. Uh, there was one question, though, that I don't think was answered, and that was to do with the height, um, or, uh, sorry, the positioning of the uh, the three storied buildings. And I'm wondering if you might comment on that. Yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot that one. Um, yeah, in actual fact, 16 metres was the height initially proposed, um, but we raised concerns about that, and the maximum is now proposed to be 12.5. And what that is consistent with the building heights um, in the other phases of the development, because um, the SPD sort of sets out expectations in terms of building heights with the taller buildings along the um, SDR corridor and then heights reducing further into the development parcels. But also that there should maybe even be slightly taller buildings in the areas um, such as the neighbourhood centres. So within phase two, um, there is the possibility for four storey development in the neighbourhood centre and a couple of other key locations where you want landmark buildings to identify them as destinations within the development. Um, but this development would be um, of much more of a sort of routine height um, of three storey just on the SDR corridor. OK, Pauline. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I'd just like to pick up on one of the points Mr Morrissey made again about the um, parking and, the, and the, uh, the, the parking around that area, which does damage the verges already. That road seems to be, or the, the road to, um, to the school, even though it's, it doesn't look like it's a public right of way, seems to be quite heavily used by walkers. Is there any um, control on the edge of the Sang to avoid it encouraging uh, even more people to park somewhere along that lane? and walk to the Sang, because I think I can't tell from this plan whether there's a fence along that side or not. But if there isn't, I think it's likely to attract even more people to go down the lane towards the school and then nip into the Sang. And I think that might encourage even more parking along um, whatever the name of the road is. Is it Lockley Road? Yeah. And the second question, um, the, the, the positioning of the um, listed building. I was looking at the, the allotments on number four. Can I be assured that they're going to be fully um, concealed from that listed building? Because some allotments can end up looking rather like shanty towns. And I wouldn't like to see a shanty town allotment with plastic double glazing or what air, things used to make it actually sort of spoiling the, the environment around that listed building. Or will there be planning controls over what people put in those allotments? On the um, question of the um, access and sort of informal parking, um, just at that point, actually, you sort of, when you come from Lutley Road, you come under the railway bridge and then shortly beyond it, the lane forks. Um, and so the right hand fork is the Ludgrove School access, which is a private route, um, but has permissive pedestrian access along it, um, granted by the school. And then the um, left hand fork, I think, is also private and it's the lane that leads to the um, development in Chapel Green. And it's just at that point that the proposed emergency access and the footpath um, cycle way would emerge. And I think um, clearly the information we've got on that connection is very high level at the moment and it needs to be worked up in more detail. Um, and I would have thought it would be possible to put, I think, as it's been suggested, maybe timber bollards or something um, to try to deter parking. I mean, there's a limit to um, what can probably be done because people can be very determined. But I think there could be measures incorporated in the design there to try to address that issue. Sorry, I uh, think you missed the point, actually. The I understand that. I understand, understand you could put bollards in to, to deter people. What I want to make sure is that that sang further up hasn't got a natural access from the the lane that goes to the school and therefore doesn't encourage even more people to go that way than currently do already. Um, I see what you mean, yes. No, I think, well, there's certainly um, fencing along that boundary at the moment um, and also fencing boundary treatments are required um, as part of the sort of more refined landscaping of the SANG um, and bearing in mind also that in most cases that they need to be dog proof as well. Um, I think we can certainly ensure that there's fencing um, along that boundary. Um, so. I was just going to say thank you. The, the other question about the allotments. Yeah. 
Yes, um, on the allotments, um, actually the, that lane that I was just talking about goes up alongside the Lucas Hospital and there's quite a strong hedge um, on the side furthest from the hospital building. I don't know if you saw the photos in the um, photo pack that was sent out before committee. There was a couple of pictures of it in there. Um, but and the landscaping condition has specifically said that we would be looking to see that boundary reinforced. And I think you're absolutely right about the allotments and what can happen on them. Um, and the land is being transferred to the council. So the council will actually have um, quite a lot of control on the layout of the allotments. And what I would expect to do through um, the reserve matters and conditions on that is to probably control areas where sheds and things can be erected, sort of liaison with the green infrastructure officer and the um, built heritage officer to ensure that it meets the needs of allotments without resulting in a proliferation of sheds um, that detracts from the setting. Would it be possible to put a comment in somewhere or is it necessary to put a comment in somewhere just to ensure that happens and that the hedge is protected and that the fencing is done? I think the landscaping condition does already refer to reinforcement of that boundary as one of the specific things that need to be um, addressed through the detailed landscaping scheme for the site. Um, and I think the fact that the allotments will be being brought forward by the council um, is something that we will have control in, with over through that method. So I think I can certainly add an informative or something if that would be um, useful. I think it might be just to avoid any doubt later to have an informative that comments about the, the use of the allotments and the control over what people build on them. The fence I was talking about was actually the one along the side of the sang, but I take your point, it's going to have to be dog proof, that's fine. Could you draft a, a, an informative, Emmy? Yes. Yeah. You at the end. Uh, where the sang is and the comments that um, this development will not make it any worse, but the actual current situation is this floods every year. These actual footpaths are currently impassable several times in the year. So Andrew did ask the question, I know you've answered it, which said that you do expect that in weather events it will flood and there will be an alternative route. So I don't know if there is much reassurance you can give me there, really. Sorry, was that about the, the paths in the Sang or the wider area? Yeah, it's the, foot, the, the footpaths that go within the Sang and then linked down to the railway bridge, that particular footpath. Um, is routinely flooded now. So I, I hear what you're saying and that it's not going to make it any worse, but it currently is routinely flooded. Yes, I think, I mean, I think it, it, it will be. And I think the proposals should probably improve that because um, I think certainly because you've got the, the, um, the ramp for the bridge ramping up and the footpaths leading to them. So um, certainly what we looked at when the, the SANG layout was being drawn up was to look at the sort of the flood maps and the areas that were likely to be flooded um, and the frequency of it and kind of had regard to that to make sure that the, um, the sort of circular route should be um, accessible. Right, so let's go to the recommendation on page five. Uh, Gary. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the first point I'd, I'd like to point out is in September 2017, uh, uh, a member of the public, Clive Schaefer, presented a petition of 2,349 signatures to the council um, uh, where he was concerned about the development and, and traffic on Finchampton Road. Um, it was debated in council and the then leader set up a traffic advisory group um, which was going to take this forward and sadly he lost his seat and with the change of in the administration they just using Clive's words and um, they walked away from any public input into the present and future state of roads around Wokingham. Um, he went on to say that everybody looks at the situation know, knows that that Finchampton Road is going to go from barely passable to impossible as a new development around the southern distributor road feeds over a thousand new cars into the road every morning and every evening um, at the existing bottleneck at Tesco. I won't go any further than what he said, but it's really to point out that it's not just what we have in front of us, but 2,349 people five years ago were very concerned about this this particular thing. Um, and we should really note 
the views of two and a half thousand odd residents. As for the actual planning application, um, the reference is to 35% affordable housing, but there seems to be hardly any one and two bedroom units. I think I, I worked it out as three, but I may be wrong. Uh, trees were a big worry for me. In paragraph 11, tree protection fails to indicate to us how many trees will be cut down, where they are, and what planting will take their place. There's absolutely nothing. It's ecologically and environmentally unfriendly especially in a climate change environment, yet the council tr tree officers and landscape have no objection subject to, as, as they write it, very vague conditions. Um, the Town and Country Planning Act and the NPPF uh, state that planning decisions should contribute to and enhance the natural and local environment. For this reason, I'd really like to see the council imposing an area TPO on this development. Uh, comment on the loss of trees on page 47 um, is important because officers actually suggest there are other benefits that outweigh the harm caused by the by the loss of trees, and I can't think of any. And there's a single TPO tree, but there's no guarantee of its protection in the report. Uh, new trees, uh, the point was covered earlier, so I won't cover it again about guarantees um, about the loss of trees, because the, the suggestion is 25% of all new planting dies. And I know the council were looking at um, an alternative to a green bond uh, as a means of um, ensuring that uh, dead trees are replaced. Um, paragraph 25 mentions flood risk assessment, and there were points made about flooding by several members here. Um, and they talk about Assessment Addendum 2022. I've never heard of Addendum 2022, but but again, it's like trees that suggest that more or less really leave it to the officers to to decide. Electric charging points are mentioned, but again, it's leave it. Thames Water Commons are covered in the amended notes. Environmental issues such as ecology, pollution, and uh, particularly the Fitzhampton Road a challenge, but the officer comments again don't actually address the concerns with, with words they such as um, not acceptable. It, it, the the detail is lacking in the report, and my view is, if it was a brand new development of 171 houses are not actually connected to this SCL, would we expect more from the report? And, and I view, I believe that we would. I mean. In terms of my personal view on the planning application, I said um, more detail on pollution traffic on the Finchampton Road is required. We need, we should have an area TPO. There should be more specific information on the number of trees to be removed and replaced, ideally with a drawing to support that plan. We need more detail on electing charging points and education is mentioned as not necessarily a planning issue but it certainly is because it impacts on schools, roads, and uh, et cetera. And in a way, I think that in my personal view is this planning application should be deferred while the various points raised by members here are looked into and a proper report with detailed answers is brought back to us. Thank you. Thank you. I think your comments about the uh, traffic probably would have been dealt with by the SWDR application, which we've already approved, of course. Uh, but can you comment, Emmy, on the uh, Gary's comments on trees and mass, uh, what do you call mass TPOs? Area TPO. Area TPO. Area TPO. Yeah, I think an area TPO is something that's normally put on a development, a site where there's a sort of a known threat of development um, to protect trees before um, things get to this stage, really. Because um, in this situation, and I think the sites were the SDLs were reviewed a few years ago and some trees have been protected by TPO but I think in this case um, we have a tree survey that has assessed the quality and condition of all the trees on the site um, it's identified trees that are proposed to be removed and the high quality important trees that are proposed to be retained which is the majority of the trees on the site um, and it's in the landscaping scheme indicative landscaping for the 
um, SANG, well, actually fairly detailed landscaping details for the SANG that show, um, and the landscape office has been able to review that and see that the number of trees will exceed significantly the number to be removed. And I think um, the summary of representations, I've, I've cross-referenced um, the relevant sections of the report and 5.2 um, of the report sets out the, the um, number of trees to be lost and um, the quality of them. Um, I think also the comment of, um, that the proposals are not ecologically friendly. In actual fact, the existing habitats on the site, um, the um, horse paddocks are not particularly rich environments. And the proposals for the landscaping of the Sang and the other areas uh, around the um, site offer opportunities to enhance the ecology of the site, actually, and particularly with the requirement which is conditioned for a biodiversity net gain. Um, there is a the environment, um, Natural England have a, a mechanism for assessing the baseline ecologically and um, the proposals to ensure that the ecology of the site is improved. Um, the flood risk assessment addendum is one of the application supporting documents that was submitted recently. Um, and I think there's not been a suggestion that education isn't a planning issue. I agree it completely is a planning issue, um, which is why within the strategic development location as a whole, there are two new primary schools being delivered. Um, and also the new housing will be contributing um, community infrastructure levy, which will fund um, secondary education as well. Thank you. Gary, did you want to pursue your proposal for deferral? I'll just make a couple of comments first. Um, the the report actually clearly states that the secondary education is not a planning issue. It's it's, it's in the report, and and that's why I challenge that point. And as for an area TPO, um, it's it's not historic. It's not history. The, this borough has put 144 area TPOs on 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 trees within the borough for various reasons. But I think they they um, it does it does impose. Uh, it does impose constraints on what they do, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to see the the best job is done. Um, carry on. Over to you, brother. Um, Chris, could I just jump in very quickly? I was merely going to say, if you wished to, to, to propose a deferral, I was happy to second it, primarily on the basis that I, I think I would rather wait to see the removal of the environment agencies holding objection before I was confident we could proceed. But that would be my basis for supporting a deferral if that's what you wish to propose, Gary. Okay, somebody was, was it Colin wants to come in? Yes, Chris, if that's possible. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so on a number of Gary's points, I mean, I, th I think Gary's is saying that the, re the report doesn't cover all the detail. I think there has to be an element of trust placed in professional officers to make decisions. Um, obviously, all the documentation is online. Uh, an application like this has got hundreds of thousands of, of, of information with it. Um, the report is very long already. If you look at the committee, how many pages in it? Um, we can't put every piece of information in there, and we have to rely on on the on the professional officers like Amy and the tree officer and the, and the drainage officers to make those decisions on behalf of, of members. Um, I think that that's one point I would make. Um, on the tree element, Amy did correctly say that um, we on this in this instance it's a specific application for the site, so it's been looked at in detail by the tree officer. Um, uh, and they've reviewed it and they have uh, found it to be sound. And again, it's, there has to be an element of, of trust in, in your professional officers. Um, that's all I would have to say. The only thing we just need to consider on the, on the flooding element, it is an outline application, which means if there is uh, the EA come back with an objection or an issue, there is scope to reduce the, the development areas on the site. So there is scope for the number to go down from the 171. Um, to, to compensate for that. Um, but this area has been, uh, as I think Amy or Chris said, has been um, extensively flood modelled, probably more than most sites because of the amount of development happening there and because of the road. So I think everybody is pretty confident in the modelling uh, and with the environment agency as well, with their comments. Unfortunately, they're, they're being very, very slow at the moment um, and not coming back to us. But I think 
but the point is there is an opportunity to, to amend the scheme if required if there's a flooding issue um, or as Emmy said originally that if there is a significant issue that can't be resolved the scheme would have to come back to planning committee anyway because it would be a redesign um, so I think there is a, there is a safety net for us to, to remember on this thank you thank you yeah, um, trust is a very brutal word, and, and it, it goes two ways. And I'm very, I, I regret that you use that word. What you have to understand is we're we are lay members um, who get some training in planning, and we take that forward, and we rely on. Uh, we have the confidence and trust of the planning officers to provide us with the right information. But the dilemma is when um, the information is not in the report that you need to be able to make a decision, then in a way there's really no need to have a planning committee um, unless we can challenge um, the reports and try and improve them or correct them. I think that's that's our function. And I, I would like to um, propose a deferral, um, uh, picking up on the point, um, awaiting the outcome of the environment agency's views plus an area TPO uh, to be reviewed and um, more information on, on the specific number of trees being removed and um, I would leave it at that. Let me just come to report. Pauline wanted to come. Thank, thank you. I, I just wanted to pick up on Gary's point about the area TPO. I wasn't clear what the officer was saying. You said that there was going to be a survey and that the significant trees had been identified. What I didn't hear was that those would be subject to TPO. I've recently had a problem in early where you get to a point where your TPO can't be put on a mature tree unless it's under threat and a threat to a mature tree is a bloke up it with a chainsaw and it's too late. So will all the mature trees that you've identified in that report be subject to a TPO as part of this development? There's no proposal at the moment to um, put additional TPOs on trees on the site other than those that are there at the moment um, because there's no particular reason to think that they are under threat. The proposals allow for their retention. Um, I think if that was something members wanted to pursue, um, it, for, it's separate to the sort of the planning decision um, and it would need to be taken up with the landscape team. Although, as I say, I believe in the past they have done a review of this area and included what they considered to be the most important trees in TPOs already. I, I would certainly like to see that. I've I've seen several large oak trees taken down by people with chainsaws that didn't have TPOs on them. By the time you've got somebody up the tree chopping it, that's the first time it's actually under threat. It's far too late. So I would prefer to see all the mature trees that you've identified as important covered by a TPO before we go any further. OK. Um, Gary, you've made a proposal, a three-pronged proposal to about concerning the Environment Agency in resolving um, uh, an agreement between them and us to consider an area TPO and you want more information on the number of trees that will be removed. Okay, so um, Stephen has have, you have his second man, Stephen. So can I can say those. Could I just Sorry? point out? Could I just point out paragraph sixty-five lists the number of trees that are proposed to be removed? So um, I can quite understand um, the wish to defer for the Environment Agency, but I think that information is already in the report. Okay, would you like to, would you consider removing the, that request then, since the information seems to be there? The point of an area TPO, forgetting about this, is that you go about development two ways. You, you, you've got a piece of land and you put loads of houses on it, or you have a piece of land with trees on it and you take the trees out so you can put more houses on it or put them where you like. 
Now, an area TPO prevents a developer from coming along and saying, we'll take out those trees there because we want to put more houses there, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent trees. And so the area TPO protects that. It means that when they come back uh, with the detailed planning application, they, they will say, we've got to remove those trees there, there, and there, and there. We so we don't like that. And, and that's why I, I like the principle of, a, of, a, of an area TPO. But if, if, if other members are comfortable to remove it, I'm happy to do so. I, was, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the last point, which is you're asking for information about the number of trees of we're proposed to be removed, and they are it's in the agenda. Yes. It's referred to, so yeah. that, that can go, yeah. can't it? Happy with that. Okay, so it's just the first, the environment agency and the area TPO consideration. So can I see those members in favour of uh, deferring this application? Sorry, could we, take, could we take this Pardon? separately, please? Pardon? Could we take these two points separately? Because I'm not that keen on deferring it, but I would like to see the TPO. Well, it's, a, well, it's what's been proposed. So I take the vote on it. Those members in favour of deferring for these two reasons, which is two. I'm going to go. Oh, four. And those against? Right, so that's lost. So I think we now go to the recommendation, um, which is on page. Oh, the informative. Oh, I've forgotten what it's about. I mean, what was that, Pat? Um, that was at the set of the Lucas Hospital, and I was going to suggest something along the lines of the layout of the allotments, including the siting of sheds and other ancillary structures, shall have regard to the setting of the Grade One listed Lucas Hospital. Okay, I, I suspect that's not not controversial. Uh, Stephen, do you had another? I, I'm entirely in agree with that. Uh, did not Angus, you want a, an informative? relating to Gypsy Lane? I've got, I've got a satisfactory answer, I think. Oh, you think you're happy with that? Okay. Sorry, sorry, Chris, I still don't think I've got an answer on the TPO. What I'd like to see is a TPO. I, I don't care whether it's a blanket TPO, or whether it's a TPO on the individual trees that have been identified, but I would like to see that on the site. Is that something we can propose now? The trees identified are for removal. I meant the trees, that the, the, the officer said that they'd done a survey and identified all important trees on the site as well. They're the ones I want to protect, not the ones that are designated for removal. Well, the deferral is just being lost. That's why I wanted to split the vote. I, don't, I wasn't interested in a deferral, I'm interested in protecting the trees. Proposing a condition. I think, I mean, the the process for TPOing trees is separate, um, but we could um, recommend a condition um, if that would reassure members. Uh, Councillor Dennis, I believe, has got his hand up. Would you like to say something? Uh, very quickly, with regards to informatives, several people have mentioned uh, the wooden posts along Lockley Road, so it would be useful to have that actually documented and put forward as an informative for this uh, development. outside the scope of the uh, application. So, so can, can we come back to the thing we were in the middle of discussing, which was the condition of the TPO? Please. Yes, Pauline, are you proposing a condition? Proposing whatever will result in a TPO on the trees that have been identified as being of value. Right. Is that a suitable condition? I think probably the best thing would just be separately um, for the committee to ask the um, landscape team to look at it um, because it is a separate process to the planning decision. Um, I, don't, I don't want them to look at it, I want them to do it. Sorry, when I say look at it, I mean to to review the report and TP any, any trees that they would consider um, appropriate, yeah. I think the question which we're um, seeking uh, an answer to is, is it within the scope of this committee to um, recommend a condition with regards to TPOs? Now, it seems to me that if it is, that there are two options. One option would be to have an area TPO, uh, as Gary um, has suggested. Another option would be to, um, um, uh, to impose TPOs on those 
um, uh, trees that have been marked uh, to be retained. Um, that's my understanding. I do have a personal preference um, on this, and that is um, for an area um, TPO, which my understanding is um, would still allow um, applicants, um, you know, to apply um, at some later point, um, you know, for trees to be uh, trimmed or, or felled or whatever, and that would be considered on its merit. Um, uh, but it would give a much broader um, uh, uh, degree, you know, of protection, geographically, if that's the right word, you know, than the uh, just labelling, you know, individual trees. So that would be my view. If it's within the scope of this committee to make that recommendation for a condition, then I would certainly be happy to, you know, uh, to second that um, proposal. Okay. Can we do that, Hemi? Um, I think sort of, if not probably something that would properly be conditioned, but it's something that the committee could ask the landscape team to do. Uh, what I would say is I think we've gone beyond the point where an area TPO would be appropriate. That is normally the appropriate mechanism when you don't have any knowledge about the condition of the trees on the site. In this case, we do have a tree survey. We do know which are the good quality trees, and that would inform the decision about which ones were worthy of protection and which ones didn't need to be protected by TPO. I'd also just like to point out to the members um, that we do already have the normal conditions you would expect on tree protection. So um, based on the... Um, the tree information that's already been submitted. Um, we've got condition 11, um, which um, requires more tree information, um, a reserve matters to be accompanied by updated arboricultural impact assessments, and then an arboricultural method statement and scheme of works for every phase of the development as well, plus the condition about no trees or hedges being, which are retained, um, shown to be retained being removed um, without prior written consent, so the normal sort of suite of tree protection conditions that you would expect to see. I don't, I don't think that's sufficient, Chris, because I'm worried about not just the development, but after the development's done, that future owners of the houses don't take access to the trees either. Can I jump in again, please? Please, Connor. So yeah, so I absolutely understand what Pauline is is, is trying to secure. Um, from the point of view of this scheme, so the development in front of us, we, as Emmy's pointed out, we have conditions on there that protect the trees that are shown to be worthy of um, protection and retention. Um, that gives us time um, for the the tree team to actually TPO the trees um, because it is a separate process. Uh, there has to be a reasonable, um, we, we have to be reasonable in terms of imposition of, of conditions on this. And I think we're, we're protected at this stage from any trees being taken out that we th think should be retained. So that, as I say, there, it does give us time to look at that and the tree team to go out and look at it and actually TPO the trees if, the, if that's what the council wants to do. Rochelle. Yes, we would like to TPO the trees now, not waiting till later to see what will happen and we'll never find out whether it actually gets done or not until afterwards when we suddenly find the trees are missing uh, or the residents call us and say the trees are missing. I, I hate to say this, it's we're asking just to TPO those trees and th that's a reasonable condition to put in a planning application. Um, I think the problem is, Rochelle, it's a, it's a separate process to the planning. It's, so so it's TPOing trees is a separate legal process. Um, as as Emmy pointed out, there is, there is I would, Argue there is sufficient coverage on the site at the moment to protect the trees on there and as i said it gives us some time so if, if members are if that's what they want members can can direct the, the council's landscape team to tpo the trees they've got the data they've got the information they can go and do it i don't know how long it takes but it doesn't take that long um but they have all the information they need so so it's the the, the developers can't go and cut down all the trees tomorrow for instance, and um, there's no, going to be no development on that site for some time because they have to get the reserve matters. They have to do a lot of things, conditions if there was if this was to be approved. So there is adequate time for the for the council to TPO whatever trees if that's what you want to do. Um, to, to make business, um, may I suggest that we, uh, we we've received an assurance that the, the, the trees that they need of protection are protected by the landscape condition. Could we now just add to that an informative requesting that we wish those trees to be 
TPO'd as rapidly as possible. I think that solves our problem. Um, I would suggest that's the way forward. OK, um, take a vote on that, because those in favour of Stephen's proposal are important. I think everyone is supportive of that. Uh, so we will add that. I think that clears that up then. I hope so. Right. So second attempt recommendation on page five. Um, so we have this informative. We have the other informative that Emmy drafted. Sure, I think we're happy. There was another one as well. Yeah, I got. This. I was coming on to that. Yeah, and supplementary we have uh, on page three of the supplementary planning agenda, mission three twelve. There's a minor typo there. Cross reference missing. There's an additional, additional, con additional condition number sixty, to do with foul drainage and an informative thirty five, on the same page. Okay. Anybody, uh, if we're happy with that, I will uh, go to the vote then. So can I see those in favour of approving this application? Please show. Eight. Eight. And those against? One. And one abstention, I guess. Thank you very much. We need to make up some time, I think. Although the debate was thoroughly worthwhile. Mm. Page 143. Lander 1014 1100 Series Escale Road in Winners Triangle Business Park. And Joanna Carter, who's been waiting patiently, is the case officer. Over you, over to you, Joanna. Thank you, Chair. I will try to share my screen now. Uh, can you please confirm if you can see it OK? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. OK, this is application number 214183, land at 1040 and 1100 series Eskdale Road, Winners Triangle Business Park. The application is retrospective and seeks a temporary planning permission for a period of five years for the erection of two sound stages and eight workshops, together with associated access, parking, landscaping, and infrastructure. The application site measures 1.97 hectare and is indicated here with a red outline. It lies south of A329M motorway and north of Eskdale Road. It falls within Winners Triangle Business Park shown with a blue outline. Winners Triangle train station served by London Waterloo Line is located further south. There is also a park and ride located nearby with bus service offering connections to Reading. Winners Triangle Business Park is identified in the core strategy as core employment area, where proposals resulting in expansion or intensification of employment uses are specifically encouraged. The proposed use associated with film production would generate approximately 250 direct and 250 indirect jobs. Therefore, the principle of development in this location is acceptable. The application site comprises two plots, 1040 and 1100, which are separated by plot E2 sitting between them. Plot 1040 lies to the east, whilst plot 1100 is situated west of E2. Both sites are accessed off Eskdale Road, which serves the wider Winners Triangle Park. The proposal is for eight workshops, which are distributed evenly between both plots. Additionally, plot 1100 accommodates two sound stages. The proposal also incorporates car, motorbike and cycle parking, with a number of parking spaces offering electric vehicle charging. The following slides include photos showing both plots from various viewpoints along um, SK Road and A329M. This slide shows views from SK Road looking north, and um, visible here are two workshops and access of SK Road. This slide shows views from SK Road looking east towards 1100 Castle. Um, you can see here sound stages and the um, 
neighbouring E2 building, as well as the uh, future warehouse and office development at 820 series. This slide shows the um, relationship between uh, sound stages and workshops at 1100 series plots. And here we have um, uh, captured the relationship between 1100 parcel and E2 office building. Here are the views from the eastern end of Eskdale Road, showing views to the west. And here this slide shows um, the sports hub, which has been recently erected, uh, that sits um, east of the uh, sound stages at 1100 plots, and also a Jacobs office building further to the east. This photo shows long views of Winners Triangle when traveling east along A329M. And here we have closer views of workshops and sound stages on plot 1100, as well as Jacob's building further in the background. This was just a very brief presentation. And in summary, the site is located within an area intended to accommodate proposals generating employment. It is in a highly sustainable location with a variety of transport options available. The proposal integrates well with the surrounding area and will deliver significant economic benefits in terms of employment generation. It will also stimulate future development of a larger scale studio space that would seek to meet the identified need for studio space in UK. The recommendation to members is three tiered as set out in the report. The application is recommended for approval subject to conditions and completion of a section 106 legal agreement. The third part of the recommendation asks that members authorize refusal in the event of Section 106 agreement not being signed uh, within three months or with an extension agreed. I would uh, draw members' attention to the supplementary agenda, which includes an updated list of drawings to be approved, additional representation made, additional condition and clarification in relation to internal floor space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have one speaker, Oliver Bell, who's the agent. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Good evening, members. <clears throat> My name's Oliver Bell and I'm a director at Nexus Planning and I speak today on behalf of the applicant Stage 50. Stage 50 specialises in the design, build and operation of professional sound stages in boutique film and television studios across the UK and Europe. One example of these includes farm uh, film studios with tenants including Netflix, Amazon and Sony. The film and TV industry has been one of the fastest growing sectors in the UK economy for a number of years, fueled by, fueled by government incentives to encourage such uses, coupled with exceptional talent pool that exists, particularly in the southeast of England. The shortage of purpose built studios and production support space is, however, a major issue in the UK industry. And this temporary application has specifically been submitted to accommodate the needs of a major international production company. Pre-production activities have taken place from some of the existing buildings within the business park, and this application represents the first phase of Stage 50's investment plans with a permanent application for wider proposals due to be lodged later this year. Although not subject to this application, the intention is to develop a new creative quarter through the delivery of Winash Film Studios. Stage 50 is already committed to 50,000 square foot of office space with a final studio plan comprising some six sound stages supported by 50,000 square foot of workshops within existing and new buildings proposed across the business park. This will include the creation of one of the largest virtual production stages in Europe. The application before you today will create 250 direct jobs and Stage 50's overall plans have the potential to create 500 direct jobs in the film and TV production sector. The proposals will also generate substantial supply chain benefits. This will range from the patronage of local shops and restaurants to the demand for specialist services such as makeup artists and set creators. The proposals will therefore support a further 250 jobs initially and ultimately a further 500 jobs, a significant boost for the economy. As you'll be aware, this application is retrospective, which clearly is undesirable. However, this is a reflection of the significant challenges posed by the fast pace of the creative industries and limited ability of the English planning system to accommodate it. Indeed, where works not to commence prior to planning permission being granted, the economic opportunity associated with this production would have been lost to Wokenham and likely the UK as a whole. 
Importantly, we engage with your officers at an early stage to explain the situation and how they process a project in a pleasingly proactive, pragmatic and collaborative manner. We also engage with Winners Paris Council and they've responded positively to the proposals. Indeed, no objection has been raised by any local resident. The committee report identifies that the proposals comply with all relevant policies of the development plan, that there are no objections from consultees and accordingly recommends that planning permission is given, a position we highly support. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, two of the uh, Borough Council members for Winners, Paul Fishwick and Prue Bray, have expressed their support to me for this application and the third member is Rochelle so I'll come to her first. It's nice to see that Woking is becoming the Hollywood of uh, of the UK but I wouldn't really want to be Hollywood. Hollywood is not the nicest place in the world to be brutally honest I've lived in the area before and it was just not the place you'd want to go during the evenings uh, but uh, we should be very proud to have streaming media coming out of Woking and uh, I'd like to see a few jobs for youth apprentices uh, in this particular location, because we'd like the young people to get some new t uh, training, especially after the pandemic, to be able to have something new to be able to do. I think it's a great idea, great place to do it, and I'm definitely in favor of it. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this? Stephen? Yeah, I've only got one question. Um, page one five five, it says that the uh, the site where these buildings are was previously overspilled par car parking. Um, if overspilled car parking was necessary, what's happening to the people that were parking in the overspilled car parking, or is overspilled car parking just code for loose land that hasn't got anything on it? Um. The applicant advised that the demand for overflow car parking has reduced as a result of the hybrid working patterns of the users of Winners Triangle, and that this has been evidenced through termination of um, parking license agreements. Um, therefore, the uh, landowner doesn't anticipate future demand for parking for, from occupiers, and this is considered acceptable given the temporary nature of the proposal. And um, as set out in the officer report, should a permanent application be made, the applicant would be expected to demonstrate that overall the scheme would not have a detrimental impact on local parking, um, functioning or um, local highway network. Thank you. Uh, Stephen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think this is uh, an application that I welcome. It, uh, it clearly is going to generate jobs and that's a very good thing. I support entirely Rochelle's point about uh, the, the hope that this might actually be an opportunity for uh, young apprenticeships. Uh, it's an ideal location for such a thing. The only uh, regrettable aspect of the application is that it is um, retrospective, which is a thing that uh, the committee never likes. Uh, but uh, if we leave that aside, um, I think this is an application that we can safely support. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, also uh, feel that this is an application that has considerable merit, you know, and uh, um, uh, that I welcome. Uh, but uh, I would like to echo what uh, Stephen has just said, you know, um, uh, about this being um, a retrospective application. Uh, some reasoning for that, you know, was suggested by the applicant's agent, and I, I take that, um, you know, I've, I've, I acknowledge um, that, but. Um, we, I think we do. I certainly do have concerns, you know, when we have retrospective applications, particularly for large um, projects like this. Um, I do have one question. Um, I accept um, the line of argument why biodiversity enhancements not provided for on site. Um, however, as this is normally a requirement uh, for at least some uh, uh, for for some net biodiversity gain, um, I'm just wondering um, uh, whether. In this instance, it's too late to at least seek some sort of uh, biodiversity gain off site. Um, I say some um, because um, I imagine the nature of the existing site um, would make it very, with a lot of it being um, tarmacked um, over, I understand at the moment, would make it very difficult you know, to calculate what a fair figure might be. But I'm just wondering whether uh, that is something which um, uh, uh, might still be considered. 
Thank you. I thought, I thought I read something about biodiversity. Um, that's right. Um, the ecology report did identify a um, small area uh, of a biodiversity value, of a low biodiversity value, uh, which as a result of the proposal is converted into hard standing. So there is effectively a loss of biodiversity and um, officers sought to secure an appropriate biodiversity net gain and the applicant did commit to providing this offsite, which um, has been accepted by the council in principle and will be would be secured through a section 106 agreement. Thank you. Okay, a bit like affordable housing commuted sums, same sort. Um, sorry, I must be wrong. Uh, Rebecca. No, Bill. Yeah, could I uh, just query one thing? On the, the stages, are these um, proposed to be uh, live, audio or live audience stages and will members of the public be uh, travelling to and from the site throughout the day? And if so, is the parking of that sufficient? The answer is no. It's uh, These are stages for recording of and making of uh, movies. It's not for the public use. This, these particular buildings were unused at the moment because of the pandemic and a lot of companies had left the area and I'm very glad to see them actually reused for something useful and for bringing more jobs back to the area. I do think it's a very good idea. I'm sorry that it happens to be retrospective. I actually saw the buildings there and I was wondering why there wasn't a planning application for them. I often walk my dog through the middle of the park in the process and I'm going, hmm, this is interesting. We're getting nice new areas here and what's going on. But uh, I'm glad to see that we're actually putting to use the spaces we have for employment and increasing jobs in the area because it's ne definitely necessary. Thank you. Um, for nobody else, I'll go to the recommendation on page 144. Um, Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just had a just a quick question. That was well, first of all, yeah, um, yeah, really pleased to see this application again. Like everyone else, echoed, you know, really happy to see that Wokingham's becoming the Hollywood uh, of the UK. I think that's great. Hopefully, we'll get some more movie stars moving around it, which would be great. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to ask around. Think, you know, it's a live studio that we've live recording. I didn't see anything around said fire safety. Often there's special effects, fireproof, flamethrowers, all this sort of cool stuff. Also around soundproofing, you know, is there anything around specific done around to keep noise pollution as well safe? So that was the only really two questions that I had. Okay, so um, starting with the soundproofing, the design of the stages, sound stages is such that um, it would not allow any. Um, noise pollution to come into the yes sound stages so not to impact on the quality of um, of the recording being made and equally it's the same way the other way around uh, the sound would not be able to escape the sound stages if you like in terms of the um, uh, fire safety um, the applicant is liaising with the um, royal berkshire fire and rescue service on the roof design and um, should a change to the roof materials be required, this can be submitted as part of the uh, condition discharge application. Um, just to be borne in mind, uh, fire resistance of materials used in construction is dealt with um, under building regulations legislation. Therefore, it is not a relevant planning consideration. However, a condition is proposed that deals with potential changes to roof materials. Thank you, Thank you so much. OK. Um, Right, so go to the recommendation. We have some changes, changes which are changes to the body of the report. Uh, but as, as um, Joanna just said, there's uh, additional condition 17 on page five of the supplementary planning agenda. So um, we go to uh, page 144 of the agenda with those changes and the extra condition. I see those in favour of approving this application, please. Thank you. I think that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And we go on to um, application 214108, Herr Hatch Sheeplands, on page 175 of the agenda. And it's Simon Taylor, is the case officer. Good evening, Simon. Thank you, Chair.
Sorry. Get this one together. So application 214108 relates to Hair Hat Sheeplands. It's a horticultural nursery in Twyford at the corner of London Bath Road. It's in the Greenbelt. Um, there is a fairly long and complicated planning history um, dating back to 1976, and that's explained in the report from paragraphs 33 to 29. Um, since 2004, there's been uh, numerous planning applications, appeals, enforcement notices, um, in order of the High Court, uh, an injunction, uh, an abusive process finding against the council. More recently, uh, in, the, in the last five years, there's been about 20 applications for various non-horticultural uses, uh, many of which have been granted approval on a temporary basis. Um, the end result is that the site is in mixed use. Um, the site was commenced as horticultural with kiosk, kiosk sales and now operates as mixed use with permanent cafe uh in this location here farm shop in, in uh, agricultural barn and temporary uses for retail uh internal external space uh event space exhibition space animal display uh, a car park and offices and a surface yard to the west of the site i'll just move through the uh, various photographs of the site um, this is the internal retail space that's currently operating there's a temporary permission through to the um, March 2023, but there's also an appeal relating to its use. Uh, committee determined that application for an extension of that in August last year. Um, these are the interior of the existing glass houses. These are proposed to be demolished. Um, these have been on site for, for about 40 years now. Um, this is the rear of the glass houses looking to the south. Um, so a, a lot of them are in dilapidated state or uh, in need of repair. Um, this is the existing car park and service yard. This is the view from Bath Road, um, opposite the site on London Road, near to where the Dobby's Garden Centre is. Um, and this is the site as viewed from the intersection of London Road and um, Bath Road. And this is the entrance to the site on London Road. And this is the interior and take, taken from the internal um, boundaries of the site, looking towards the existing glass houses. And on the right of the top photograph, you can see the um, agricultural barn, which operates at the farm shop. This is uh, closer to the site near the service yard, looking towards the glass houses and the, the farm shop in the, in the um, middle distance there. Uh, this is to, to the rear of the site, existing fields. Um, so moving back to the plans, um, the application involves the demolition of most of the, the development on the site. Um, all these glass houses will be removed. Uh, the red, uh, orange plan uh, lines here is what being demolished. In its place will be a, a new garden centre uh, building at about 3,000 cubic metres uh, square metres site area with a new cafe to its south. Uh, the existing farm shop here will be retained. Um, Allotment gardens were established along the, the southern boundary of the car park. There's a, a garden area and play equipment, for children's play area, um, informal recreation space within the existing fields. To the north, there's um, woodland planting proposed. The intention behind that is for carbon capture um, and service yard and expanded car park. The, the woodland is also proposed as a flow car park. Um, the primary concern here is is in relation to whether it is in inappropriate development on the green belt. There is a disagreement between the applicant um, and the council. The council's view is that this is inappropriate development in the green belt. Um, I'll try and briefly explain the rationale behind that. Um, so the definition of um, what would constitute an exception to an inappropriate development in the green belt is listed above. At the top of the side, uh, screen here, it's previously developed land is the primary um, issue we need to consider ourselves with here. Um, so there is, a, there is agreement that's a partial redevelopment site and it is in continuing use. There's disagreement on what part of the site is previously developed land. 
and there is also disagreement on the, the extent of the impact on the Greenbelt. Um, so moving to previous de developed land, the, the definition is also um, outlined in the um, MPPF. So it is or was occupied by a permanent structure, including the curtilage. Um, it also stresses that it, it should not be assumed that the whole of the curtilage should be developed. It also includes any associated fixed service infrastructure, such as car parks and things like that. Um, there is an exception to the rule there that it is excludes land that is or was last occupied by agricultural uh, buildings. Agricultural buildings can include horticultural buildings. In this case, that would include the glass houses. Um, there is agreement that is one planning unit. There's agreement that is a mixed or sui generis use, but there is disagreement as to what extent the PDA approves to development land is. There is disagreement on the extent of the curtilage. There is disagreement on the inclusion, whether the extent permissions should be included. There are several um, permissions that have not been implemented to the car park, to outdoor seating for the cafe, um, and from redevelopment of, of existing glass houses. There is also disagreement on the temporary uses. So what the council is saying is that we don't include any of those matters. And what we have is um, for the purposes of the assessment here, we've got the red line is a, a estimated outline of the um, garden centre building. And the blue line is what the council considers to be the previously developed land as it relates to this part of the site. What the applicant asserts is that the previously developed land applies to the entire site. And the, what's on the screen here is if they took the approach that the council's taking, this would be the extent of the previously developed land. Um, in that respect, the council's conclusion is that it's inappropriate in development in the Greenbelt, and then the need to assess whether there's a consideration of uh, the impact of the, on pulling the openness of the Greenbelt. There is agreement that there is a reduction in volume. There's a substantial reduction in the overall um, number of glass houses. Um, the footprint is reduced. The overall volume is reduced in the vicinity of 30 to 35 percent. Um, there is disagreement, though, in relation to the impact upon the the, the uh, built form and the bulk of the development. So the, the structure here, being the farm shop, it will be extended uh, to the vicinity of the existing greenhouses that are on this the left side of the photo. And this building at the same height will be brought forward. So the council's view is, if you take the um, view from this area here, there will be additional built forms. So that's the council's view is there is an impact upon the openness. Um, and the applicant obviously disagrees with that, um, saying that the, the primarily the reduction in volume is, is the um, determinative factor. Um, so what we have is the applicant saying it's appropriate development. The council says it's inappropriate development. And it then needs to be determined as to whether there's very special circumstances that um, way in favour of the development. The council's, uh, the very special circumstances are discussed at paragraph 47 to 51. I don't intend to expand on them in any great detail. There are very special circumstances that the council agrees with, such as employment generation and community support. And there's in excess of 420 submissions in support of the application. Uh, there's um, also circumstances that the council doesn't agree with, such as a uh, suggestion that the abusive process should be a consideration or biodiversity net gain. Uh, they don't weigh in the planning balance. Um, the primary outcome is that the, the re application is recommended for refusal based on the inappropriate development and the harm to the openness of the green belt. And that's outlined in reason two and three, reason for refusal two and three. Um, there are uh, just briefly dealing with submissions. There are 420 submissions in support and one against. There is support from Wargrave and Ruscombe Parish Councils, the latter being received today. Uh, the overall consensus from residents is, um, and the Parish Council is that there is a um, beneficial outcome for the site the, um, and a better business outcome for the, the, the community, uh, for the owner of the site and a community outcome. There's good ecological landscape and uh, outcomes as well. There are no consultee objections, subject to further details by condition. Uh, Biovested net gain is achieved. Additional tree planting, highway impacts, satisfactory. There's no retail impact. 
There's also um, job creation during the construction and post. Um, uh, energy efficiency measures. Um, and so um, they weigh somewhat in favour of the development, but the harm not to sufficient to outweigh the harm. Um, supplementary agenda just briefly outlines the additional submissions and comments from the agent. Uh, 39 more submissions were received since publication of this uh, officer report. Uh, it briefly outlines uh, the disputes between the council, um, but it doesn't introduce anything new to the assessment. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, we have four speakers. <clears throat> uh, they're all in favour of this application. So uh, this is Alison Jones, Mark Bear, Nick Barnett and Robert Scott. Um, I think they're all here. Um, you've got three minutes to share, which is like 45 seconds each, I guess. So you'd like to come forward and I don't know how you're going to apportion your the time available. I'll leave it to you. Well, good evening. Did I say for the recommendation? I didn't mean for the application. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Alison Jones. I'm a planning director at Boyer, but I'm also a local resident and I've been a customer for over 10 years. As you will have seen from our detailed submission of the committee report, we fundamentally do not agree with the approach that has been taken in relation to the Greenbelt. As a principle, as the site is in a mixed use, its redevelopment is appropriate according to the Greenbelt tests and the proposal should be approved. However, even taking your officer's approach, their, their assessment of very special circumstances we consider to be fundamentally flawed. They do not give sufficient weight to really important matters, including those that the appeal inspector considered key, such as customer expectations, popularity and value to the community, rural job creation and training. Nor do they give significant weight to the huge community benefits as a new play area for hair hatch will be delivered, community allotments and recreational facilities, nor the huge climate change and environmental benefits, including significant levels of biodiversity net gain, over 500% for hedgerows, as well as EV charging, nor the greenbelt benefit of removing the green glasses, glass houses, which will result in a 58% reduction in floor space, and nor indeed the drastic effects of the abuse of process, which should be taken into account. But what really matters here is that the local community have clearly demonstrated that they want these proposals. They will provide a solid basis for Hare Hatch, Sheeplands and the Council to move forward in a positive and stable way. If permission is not granted tonight, then we will have to appeal. And it is likely that we will keep having to come back to the planning committee with ad hoc applications to try and keep the business afloat. And be under no illusion that if they fail, that the banks will sell to a developer and Hare Hatch will use its community heart. I'm happy to answer questions, as is Rob Scott, the owner. My name is Mark Abair, and I've been asked to represent the huge number of Sheeplands customers that support this planning application. This planning application represents opportunity in three respects. Firstly, the application stands on its own merits as a unique proposition that to the best of my knowledge, doesn't exist anywhere else within the borough. Today, more than ever, we need businesses with environmental credentials that promote biodiversity, carbon store, carbon capture, renewable energy use and sustainability. Secondly, this is an opportunity to retain and extend the benefits of Sheeplands for the local community, including local employment, work experience for young people, community organisations, local suppliers, local charities, educational establishments, and over 9,000 customers that are in weekly contact with Sheeplands. Finally, this is an opportunity to look forward. It's an opportunity to turn what has been a long period of negativity and dispute into something that is positive for everyone. The long running disagreements have been costly, disruptive and frustrating for all concerned. This is an opportunity to draw a line under the past and work collaboratively to create something that as a community and a council, we can all be proud of. So I'm asking you to grasp these opportunities 
create a positive dynamic and let the community enjoy the many benefits the Sheeplands proposal will bring to us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, members, I think Stephen's almost a local member, so I'll come to him first. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I, I'm very nearly a local member, although it, well, it, technically it doesn't sit into Iford Ward. Um, I would like to start off by, by um, thanking Simon for his report and his presentation this evening. Um, I think, as he said, this is a comp this site has a complicated planning history. It also, of course, has a contentious uh, planning history. Um, Simon's uh, attempted, I think, to present a uh, measured and very thorough assessment of the application. My reading of his report and uh, my reading of his presentation this evening is that this, in his judgment, is an on balance recommendation. And on balance recommendations are often uh, what we are, are confronted with. And uh, the very nature of on balance recommendations is there are arguments on both sides. Um, to me, well, to Simon, um, I think uh, it's clear that the balance lies in favour of uh, refusing the application. Uh, to me, the balance lies in favour of uh, approving the application. <coughs> and I'd like to explore the three reasons for refusal that are presented on page 176 of the agenda. And um, I, I will ultimately uh, finish by proposing that we, we grant planning permission uh, subject to um, a condition and, uh, and and no doubt the addition of standard conditions that officers may wish to suggest. I want to start with uh, the proposed reason for refusal uh, number one, that this constitutes inappropriate development in the green belt. Simon uh, very candidly explained that there was a dispute over whether this was previously developed land. And uh, in his judgment, uh, the whole site cannot be designated as previously developed land. Uh, but he does acknowledge on page 203 of the report, paragraph 39, that some of the site is indeed previously developed land. And that, of course, makes it permissible to, to build on this site, or at least on part of this site, uh, and still comply with Greenbelt policy. Um, it's also worth pointing out that some 70% of the site now under this application will be for horticultural use, which of course is completely compatible with Greenbelt status. Um, and I should also add that the uh, proposed new woodland area, which I'll come back to later, um, is an additional benefit. It's also, of course, completely compatible with Greenbelt use. So um, I, I think there are, there are good grounds for saying that the argument about whether it's inappropriate development in the Greenbelt uh, could be argued the other way, and I would propose it, it, it can be argued and should be argued the other way. Uh, we also have the issue of the very special circumstances that might justify putting aside uh, Greenbelt policy. Um, and in this case, two very special circumstances are actually acknowledged in the report. Local community benefits, especially in terms of employment. Um, and secondly, local community support evidenced uh, in the body of the report by either 379 or 381 submissions. And as we've heard in the update, there are, there are still more that have been submitted. There are now well over 400 expressions of support in favour of this application, only one against. Now, uh, this actually, in my mind, carries some considerable weight because an appeal inspector on previous uh, appeal on this site uh, drew attention to this and actually regarded it as a material consideration, uh, a very special circumstance. So. Um, the very special circumstances are acknowledged on page 206, paragraph 48. 
they're, they're not considered to be weighty enough. I, I, I would say this is a matter on which it's possible for people to disagree. And I, I'm afraid I do disagree with Simon on this. I think these are very weighty reasons for believing there are special circumstances that would outweigh uh, any restrictions on the green belt use of this site. Um, I want to come on now to the second reason for refusal. That's the harm to the character of the area. And this, of course, focuses on the new build element um, and uh, the point that Simon has made that this is taller uh, and bulkier than the existing uh, area that's uh, uh, regarded as um, uh, the built form. But I have to say this is uh, at least partly offset by the new woodland planting which is proposed, which would be on the northern side of the site next to the A4 and would actually, in, in, in a very significant way, I think, screen the impact of any new build, certainly from the A4. And I think uh, this concern about the new build and its height is also, I would say, offset still more by the, the very clear reduction in the total uh, footprint and volume of the built form on the site. Both the developer and uh, the council have come up with somewhat different figures for what the, the difference is or, or what the reduction is. But there is complete agreement. There is a reduction and I have to say a significant one. So I would argue that this uh, application does not um, harm the character of the area by compromising Greenbelt openness. I would say the contrary, it actually increases the openness of the Greenbelt by the removal of, of the greenhouses and the creation of far more um, horticultural and uh, associated leisure use and woodland. Um, so uh, I, I think that neither of those two reasons for refusal in my mind um, uh, uh, carry sufficient weight to overcome the contrary argument. Uh, reason refusal three, which obviously um, is appropriate to add if, if the committee were in favour of refusal, um, is actually something we can now, if you accept my proposal that we um, grant planning permission, uh, reason for reason, refusal three could become a condition, um, a lack of a um, employment skills plan could be secured by condition on a on a, a grant of permission for this application. There may well be some other standard conditions uh, that the officers would want to add if the committee is in favour of granting planning permission. Um, standard commissions we, conditions we would apply relating to um, uh, building on site and so forth and, and, and construction traffic or whatever. Um, I, I'm sure the officers would, would be able to add those. Um, but I would propose, therefore, that we grant planning permission. Thank you. I'll just hear from a few other people. Uh, Angus. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Stephen's taken us uh, along a very challenging route uh, against what uh, the planning officer has put out. Uh, and I believe it, this is an on balance decision. I think uh, in view of the very detailed rebuttal, which goes along the lines of Stevens, that uh, Boyer sent out only on the 7th of March after the agenda was issued, um, and with all the complexities that um, have been identified, I believe this application tonight should be deferred um, if it is likely, especially that we were to overturn the officer's recommendation, but to defer it on two bases, to give us, the committee, and maybe the officers, adequate consideration of that very detailed and long report that Boyers has sent out, and, and to give us an opportunity for a site visit, um, because there's lots of points, and, and Stephen raised a number of them, about the... Uh, visibility of the existing greenhouses from the A4 or the likely impact of the new building uh, from various angles. Um, 
So I, I do believe the committee would be better in a position to consider this balanced argument uh, by a site visit. Uh, so, Chairman, I would propose one, but I'm not sure how much discussion or whether you wish to take uh, forward Stephen's proposal uh, if uh, this deferral were to be also considered. Well, I, I'll second your proposal, Angus. And, and I think I need to get a second for Stephen as well, right. Gary. Um, I'll, ju I'll just make one point. I have trouble with this 2013 um, enforcement notice, which just says, which refers to the material, refers to a material change of use of the land from horticulture to a mixed use, comprising horticulture, A1 retail, A3 restaurant, cafe, D2 children's play facilities, and this stationing of a residential mobile home and that enforcement action is still in force which i would thought was contradicting the granting of applica uh, of uh, planning permission for this application if we did did do that could i could you comment on that simon please um the the council has the ability to um withdraw enforcement notices um, so if this were to be approved, then that would, would be a problem. OK. Stephen, did you have a second? I'm sure you have. Gary, sorry. You said. Yeah, perhaps we'll just hear from other members. Um, Rochelle, yeah. Sam and Andrew. Yeah, Rochelle. Just one question. If this gets permission to be a garden center, that's a retail use, and therefore any other retail use can be, cha can be changed to any other retail use without any permission from the council uh, whatsoever. So if they wanted to put a supermarket there, they could do that. Um, I believe this is the rules, uh, the latest rules by the government to allow any retail space to change to another kind of retail space without any permission. It's permitted development. Is this true? Um, in a broad sense, yes, um, it would have to be contained within the existing building. So any development change would require planning permission, but um, it, it could be feasible to in negotiation with the applicant um, to reach agreement on a, a condition that would restrict its use to garden centre type use or reflect the garden centre farm shop and cafe use. I would be comfort more comfortable if that did occur, if that was included. Uh, Sam. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think sort of looked at this sort of very carefully, and I think having having sort of heard sort of both sides of the of, of, of the argument, I think it's really really important to to consider raw views. Uh, I think looking at the sort of the points on on page. 176. I looked at the sort of three, the three key main reasons for refusal. So the inappropriate development, the green belt, harm to the character of the area, and the lack of employment skills plan. Now, sort of looking at point one, um, you know, and it, it was a very detailed explanation from Simon. I feel, you know, this this isn't just simply a development on green belt. This is a redevelopment. So that's a really key point that it's we're just developing an already a site which is already there. So I just don't wanted to make that 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 point there. Um, in terms of the point two of the, of the calm and character of the area, I felt that actually the yeah the increased woodland planting would would potentially sort of screen a lot of the the development there. And actually, having known the area very well, there's actually a, a much larger uh, site called Dobby's across the road, directly across, which you can see. So I think you know you can't have you can have one, then why can't you have the other? Um, and then my other sort of point was on three, lack of employment skills plan. I think it'd be really great to see one, but I felt that that was somewhat of a uh, sort of a petty thing to put in there as a as a reason, but it would be great to see. But I think my, on, on hearing both sides, my view would be to to approve this, um, this proposal. Thank you. And um, Andrew? Yes, thank you very much, Chair and, and Simon. Um, 
The matter of very special circumstances um, is clearly very important. And the officer's report um, has identified some very special circumstances that they um, uh, that they uh, believe do apply in this instance. I'm just wondering if, if just for my um, my own uh, sort of uh, clarity, please, um, whether you could uh, specify which very special circumstances uh, you believe don't apply um, in this instance. Um, I think the second question is picking up on something that Sam has just said. I was puzzled as to why on page 206 um, it stated that the presence of other garden centres nearby on the A4 is not a material planning consideration. Um, is that because they have planning permission um, and this hasn't? Um, I, I, I'm not certain, but could the officers um, uh, explain why, when talking about the character of the area, neighbouring properties are usually considered, and why in this instance there are neighbouring garden centres, uh, the presence of those other garden centres does not seem to be, um, you know, considered um, important. So that's kind of picking up on um, uh, on Sam's point. Um, and finally, on page 210, um, it's stated that the landscape visual impact assessment judges the magnitude of the effect on the landscape to be permanent and low. And references made to none of the 15 viewpoints experiencing a significant visual effect. Were any sites along road and pathways included amongst these, these 15 sites? Where were these, um, these reference points? Uh, thank you. The report at paragraph 49 um, and 50, or 50 actually, um, is primarily, sorry, bear with me. Yeah, paragraph 40, uh, 50 is the, um, where, where I'm making, uh, outlining the um, very special circumstances that I feel don't apply. Um, for instance, biodiversity net gain, um, it's in the MPPF uh, paragraph 174 seeks um, that as part of an application or as part of a proposal, regardless of um, whether it's uh, legislatively required or not. So um, in that respect, that's just a, a, an expected outcome of the development. So you wouldn't be able to say it's very special circumstance to to apply to the, to benefit the site and benefit the application. Um, the abusive process was an example that was cited as um, a very special circumstances. I, I don't think that's um, really a, a material planning consideration in this sense because it's um, there is it's going back several years. There's various um, circumstances surrounding that that, that are planning related. Um, it's difficult to, to come to the conclusion that that is a relevant consideration here. Um, the, there's an example of a refusal would result in other ne negative outcomes or a derelict site so um, through abandonment. So it, it that comes across as, as saying well if, if we can't get this application here then um, will just it, it'll become derelict and and that outcome is not really a planning consideration either um, other less desirable uses um, they would still need to be assessed under the the green belt policy in the MPPF just as this application is um, okay uh, yeah I, I think um, there's 15 dot points here. I, I could go through them further if you wish, um, but there are the acknowledgement in the pre the paragraphs 48 to 50 is that there are very special circumstances. That it, it is then up to the council to determine whether or not they are sufficient to outweigh the harm that, that arises. Um, in relation to the second point, the neighbouring garden centres, I, I just need additional context of the question. Are you in relation to um, the very special circumstances or the, the character of the impact? Sorry, the impact of the character of the area. Yeah, it was more the impact of the character of the area. Thank you. Um, I'd need you to draw me to the section in the report where I'm making that um, suggestion, please.
Um, it's on page 206, I think. Um, yeah, par uh, paragraph 50. OK. Yeah, so what that's um, implying is that the garden centres are, are lawful developments. Um, this application is seeking to um, go from a nursery to a garden centre. So the distinction is that there's a garden, uh, a nursery on this site as a horticultural or agricultural use with um, say uh, retail sales as opposed to a, a fully lawful garden centre across the road. That's the, the difference there. Um, and the third point, the landscape visual impact assessment, I will need to defer for a, a couple of minutes to refer to that landscape visual assessment and I can report back in that in, in a minute or so. OK. Um, yeah, Pauline. Um, yeah, thank you. I've got a few questions about this. My, my recollection of the last time with this was discussed, there was quite a lot of conversation about the retail being subsidiary and related to the um, the use as a as a nursery, rather than being retail that is is not related to that at all. I don't know if that that still continues to apply. So that's the first question: that condition that the the retail needs to be connected to a nursery and also subsidiary to the function of a nursery, rather than any sort of um, shopping, which I think probably partly deals with Rochelle's point. So that's the first question: does that st that condition still apply and that conversation still apply? Um, the second question was looking at Stephen's um, point that actually he believes it's a totally um, an area that has been developed already and should be considered like that. No, did I misunderstand? No, that wasn't wasn't the point I was making. I said uh, that the council acknowledged parts of the site are previously developed land, and my point was that the remainder of the site, or the vast bulk of the remainder of the site was in horticultural use or was going to be proposed as woodland or leisure that was compatible with green belt status. OK, sorry, I misunderstood you. So then it's a slightly different question. If that's the case, does the agreement to this planning application mean that the rest of the site then becomes considered as previously developed land and therefore is open to future development and further extension? Or is that still protected as green belt? Um, I'll attempt to answer your first question in, in a different way. Is the, the previous applications that were dealt with last year were assessed under a different part of the MPPF, um, being a change of use of an existing building, um, and that requires a, a slightly different consideration um, as to this assessment, which is a complete or partial redevelopment of, of a previously developed land. So um, that didn't require the same consideration of the retail um, attachment to the existing horticultural use. It's effectively doing away with the existing development on the site and starting again, and, and that is a provision in the MPPF. Um, second question, um, the definition of previously developed land does make a distinction that there's not an automatic entitlement that you can redevelop the entire site based on the conclusion that's previously developed land. So if you do choose to, to apply that the site is a planning unit in mixed use and wholly previously developed land, there is still the disclaimer that um, there's not that automatic entitlement to develop across the entire site. It also does require consideration of, of the impact upon the openness as well, so it's a two-step process. Um, while I am on here, I can just share the screen to in relation to the um, LVIA points. So um, they're the, the viewpoints that were taken. Um, if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Just come back on the green belt question again. Just um, if you if you're saying that which is understandable that just approving this doesn't mean you automatically have approved somebody to build on the whole site. I understand that. But does it weaken our defence against somebody continuing to develop on the rest of the site? Or 
is it is it still protected as if it was green belt? Yeah, I think the the second part of that test is protecting the openness of the green belt. Um, I'll get the exact wording of that. Um, it is in the officer report, but I think it does protect against um, the wording would specifically protect against what you're worried about happening. Um, which would not have a greater impact upon the openness of the green belt than the existing development. So it's effectively almost sterilising any significant extension subject to consideration of very special circumstances, obviously. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I just wanted to come back and clarify that my proposal that we gave planning permission, the condition that I suggested relating to the lack of employment skills plan actually needs to be in the form of a, a legal agreement relating to uh, an employment skills plan. Um, and I, I think we also need to secure, to answer Rochelle's concern, a uh, secure agreement uh, of the continued use of uh, the proposed garden centre as a garden centre. So to avoid it uh, falling into the trap of being able to be used for something else subsequently. So sui generis. Well, I think we're, what we're saying is if the granting of permission for it to be a, a garden centre, uh, which would, would be, which is what would follow this grant of planning permission, we would wish to secure that in the future and make sure it didn't become something else, a supermarket, for instance, that was suggested. Um, so I think that can be done through the legal agreement too. Okay. Um. Are, are those uh, are those acceptable as uh, conditions to Stephen's proposal to approve, Simon? Uh, I think so. I I've prepared in advance an alternate recommendation, and it does include a recommendation for um, legal agreements to secure um, the employment skills plan and to secure. Um, a mechanism to ensure that the other aspects of the development do come forward as part of the proposal. So this application relies upon the woodman planting the allotments um, and their charitable use, their use for the garden centre, uh, for the farm shop, the, the play, area, play area for the children um, and the fields to the south. So that would also be in, in the council's view necessary to be included in the um, legal agreement um, to include the limit the use on the um, limiting it to a garden centre in, in, in a legal agreement. I have to reserve judgment on that. I'm not I'm not fully certain that approach is appropriate. I'm not. Um, at the very least, I'd seek it as a condition. OK, uh, let's I'll come to Gary and then Bill and then we'll go on Stephen's proposal. Um, yeah, well, I'm happy with Stephen's proposal as he's amending it. Um, adjoining ward members of the local parish council are supportive, as with over 400 residents, um, for, um, and in a way, and even the, high, the only one objection was a highway officer, was was there was a, an objection which the highway officer uh, said was okay, so it wasn't really a, a, a very valid objection. Um, and as for the reason for refusal one and two, I would agree completely if it was a virgin site with nothing on it, I would see that point of view. But as it's not, it's actually a, 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 a an area that has lots of development on it. It's been going on for a very long time. And, 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 and really, so it's, it's got to be looked at in that context. Um, paragraph 25 states, uh, in the MPPF, development is ordinarily, uh, ordinarily, uh, ordinarily, excuse me, resisted or restricted. But the paragraph goes on to add that new development in the green belt is inappropriate. So what it's talking about here is new development. It's not talking about some sort of existing uh, business that's already there. And that brings us back to on balance. And on balance, I think there's no real 
um, reason to refuse it. I mean, Dobby's across the road. Um, uh, started off, uh, I'm guessing, as a nursery, as most of these activities do. They start off as a pick your own, a nursery or whatever. They evolve into, and they evolve into garden centres and become fairly big businesses. The locations are normally also in rural areas on uh, on the side of main roads, and they're appropriate locations for this type of development. And it's interesting reading the consultation responses on page 179. Um, the following raised no objection. Drainage, highways, ecology, trees and landscaping, environmental health, growth and delivery, Thames Water, Thames Valley Police, Natural England, Fire and Rescue. None of them have objected to this planning application. No comments were received from Economic Prosperity, Economic environmental agency, the National Grid, Southern Gas, SE Power, and, and the Wildlife Trust. So none of these also submitted comments, so I would have thought they're not objecting to it. Uh, employment skills was raised earlier, but there's a, a note on employment skills in the report that said it could be conditioned by uh, an agreement, and, and, that, and that sorts out uh, condition, uh, refu reason for refusal number three. And, and um, that could be conditioned if planning permission is granted. I, I will, I'll stop there, but my intention is to support the planning application as I really cannot see a reason to refuse it. And as the resident said when he spoke earlier, it's, this is an opportunity not to be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Bill? Thank you. Um, perhaps I'll be a little bit controversial. I'm going to wear my councillor hat rather than my planning committee member hat. We, we look, always look to see what is the best for our residents. And I think the fact that we've got 379 signatures for this and only one against is an indication of what our residents want. I think there have been many arguments for, many arguments against. I realise, you know, we do have to protect our green belt. But I think on this particular site where there is development, uh, there is a need to actually um, tidy it up with the greenhouses, and I think that can be a benefit. Um, I think there's been many arguments about uh, neighbouring um, <coughs> retail units, uh, whether they're, they're garden centres, whether they're um, nurseries or whatever they were. One that is missed, and I don't know quite how this stands, is the one on the other side of the road to them, which is now basically uh, John Deere tractors. And I think that one time that was a, a nursery and now could be likened to a, a, a car dealership more. So I think there's been a, a change of um, use there. Uh, whether that was Greenbelt, I'm not sure, but it just seems to me that there is a case to, to look at that as a, an example of why, um, you know, things can be changed. I'm inclined to um, approve this uh, uh, application based on the fact mainly that it's a community asset it's something that our residents have asked for it um, houses many other things other than its garden center it does a lot of charity work um, it supports many local organizations and i think um, it can be an asset to the the community thank you just to repeat i'd say at the beginning of the meeting we do have to determine applications according to planning law national and local and steve Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And sticking entirely to uh, the planning merits uh, of the case and trying to judge it in exactly that way, I think we have grounds uh, to grant planning permission subject um, to two conditions, plus any others that Simon has prepared. Clearly, he's prepared some in advance, for which I'm grateful. Um, the first condition would relate to the signing of a, a legal agreement to secure uh, the provision of an employment skills plan. Uh, my second condition would 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 uh, be a condition not through a legal agreement, but a condition to secure a continued use as a garden centre. Anyway, Stephen, but thank you for clarifying. I think um, Simon suggested it shouldn't be a legal agreement, so I'm trying to decouple it from the legal agreement and make it a separate condition. I see. Angus. Thank you, Chairman. Just as a procedure, uh, <coughs> that uh, assuming that uh, the committee were to agree to um, Stephen's proposal to grant planning permission, 
Um, I'd be concerned if we just left it at that, because I'm sure there are a number of conditions which we haven't seen um, and we couldn't agree on the hoof. Now, we have met this situation many times before, uh, so maybe the suggestion is that those conditions are considered um, after this meeting were it, it to be agreed uh, with the committee, uh, with, with the chairman and perhaps uh, Stephen, who, who's got uh, more local knowledge, if, if the committee were to agree that. Thank you. Um, that seems yes, Stephen's happy with that. Um, so uh, we will go to the vote. Is everyone clear what we're voting on? We, Stephen's proposed us to approve the application with what he, with the legal agreement that he set out clearly. Um, Excuse me, Chair. Is it worthwhile me interjecting and just um, putting members at ease in terms of just a brief rundown of, of what were proposed conditions? So that all the consultees have provided draft conditions because they were in support of the application. Yes, please. OK. Uh, so the recommendation would be the prior completion of legally undertaking as a standard um, recommendation um, and to secure the employment skills plan and be mechanisms to ensure the implementation of the play area fields, woodland park planting and the allotments. Uh, the addition I add is their associated use because they part of the benefits that they um, were suggesting the allotments would provide were that they had a charitable purpose. So that's their inclusion there. Um, standard condition at the front. So eco ecological conditions about species enhancement, landscaping condition, it includes requirement to meet biodiversity net gain requirements, um, a management plan to secure ongoing management, um, lighting details. So these are all pre commencement conditions. Um, construction environmental management plan, construction management. Uh, management plan, uh, carbon reduction in initiatives, uh, bin storage. There is works proposed to the vehicular access uh, that would need to be details sought for. Um, there's also a new access point to London Road, uh, sorry, to Bath Road to the north, and internal pedestrian cycle access, cycle parking, uh, travel plan, EV charging parking management strategy. Uh, the woodland area to the north is proposed as overflow parking, so we need to seek more details in relation to that as well. So delivery servicing, um, crime prevention measures, uh, and the majority of the rest of the conditions are generally standard conditions or compliance with document uh, documentation or plans. Um, condition 24 is the condition that you're probably more concerned about. Uh, I'll let you read that. Um, Eat effectively is seeking to retain it as a, a garden centre, farm shop, and cafe, and for no other purpose, um, including Class E, which is the retail use classification. Um, condition 25 limits external storage to the service yard and waste storage only. Condition 26 no additional floor space within the garden centre. Um, it usually obtained through mezzanine levels, which is permitted development. Um, and then it's informatives. The only real relevant one there is the Section 96 agreement. It's also subject to community infrastructure levy. Um, if there's no questions in relation to that, I'll leave that. Uh, Mary Severin, the barrister. So good, good, good evening. Good evening, Chairman. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, two things. First of all, um, Angus's um, proposal to defer. Um, please could Angus withdraw that if he's happy to do so in light of the subsequent conversations about um, going against office recommendations. Secondly, um, if members are inclined to vote for uh, against office of recommendation, please could they state brief reasons or for Callum to state in the minutes what why they want to go against it and it has to it only can need to be brief for example they need to say for example that they do believe that there are special circumstances to approve uh and that in light of the conditions that there will be no or lit, little harm to the character of the area after all and of course the the employment skills plan is already in there i hope that makes sense 
Would you be happy with those, Stephen? Uh, I'm very happy with, with the wording that Mary's just given us there um, to justify uh, granting planning permission. Uh, I don't think I ne any longer need to persist with my suggested condition relating to the condition as the use, continuing use as a garden centre. Simon's already incorporated that as his condition 24, I think. So I'm, I'm very happy just looking, scanning through those conditions. Most of them are standard. Um, and I don't, I don't see anything that looked objectionable. So I'm quite happy. So your garden centre would disappear from your proposal? Well, it's it's incorporated as yep. that what's now um, condition 24. The proposal that I made, I think, was made after Stevens uh, and therefore wouldn't come up until we voted on Stevens. Uh, and despite that, nobody else has supported that in any of the things they've said. So I'm prepared to withdraw that. For the record. OK, so I think we can go. Uh, well, we don't go to the recommendation. We go to Stephen's recommendation. No. Stephen's, sorry. Sorry again. We're voting on Stephen's proposal, which has been seconded by Gary. She has uh, spelt out clearly. We've seen what the conditions would be. Um, so is everybody happy with that? So I can see those in favour of supporting that. Nine, those against? And abstentions? One. Thank you very much. So that application is approved. Um, we now move on to 214046, Auto Trader House and Hockman House in Lower Early, page 241. Thank you, Chair. Um, Over to you again, Simon. Thank you. Uh, uh, the application relates to Auto Trader House. Uh, um, could you just hold on a second, Simon? Uh, yeah, let sure. Angus wish to speak. Uh, Chairman, th there's just over 20 minutes left. Uh, and just as a, uh, a precaution, could I propose that uh, if we haven't finished by 10.30, we should be almost there, uh, that we do agree as a committee to extend for half an hour? Second now. Excellent. I second. Just going to do that. Sorry? That works, isn't it? You seconded it now. Uh, all right. Already. Can I, without wasting too much time, can I see those in favour of that, please? Extending if necessary. That looks unanimous. Unanimous. Sorry, back to you, Simon. Thank you. Um, the application relates to land at Auto Trader House and Hartman House, two largely derelict buildings in Cutbush Industrial Area on the plans here. So you've got the M4 and lower early way to the south, um, relatively dense woodland to the east and as to the west and the north of the site. Um, the proposal is to demolish the two buildings on site um, and replace it with the uh, a 3,000 square metre uh, warehouse building in class B and class E use. Uh, it's intended for a logistics use. Um, proposed for 24 hour use and would include open plan warehouse and mezzanine office space. Uh, in front of you are the elevation plans um, and a photo montage of the site. Um, the site has been subject to um, vandalism and illegal occupation in the past, um, so it would represent a reuse of a brownfield site. Um, that is the site's condition at the present moment. There's a condition, there's a extent permission for 76 dwellings on the site that was approved at appeal. It's extent to the end of June. Uh, there's no intention to deliver on that permission. Um, the application is subject to zero objections from members, town council, residents, or consultees. It's broadly acceptable. It uh, reuses a brownfield site, has good logistics access to the M4. Um, it's adequately screen, screened from uh, by the vegetation from surrounding roads, set back from the road. Um, it's well removed from residents, um, has a positive design with an excellent BREAM rating, um, 
which would be secured by conditions, good landscape outcome as well. So I just briefly identify the main issues, which is it's much larger footprint and much larger height. Um, so 30 metres height, but because of its screening and setback from the road and the planting, uh, it was considered acceptable. There's a departure from the parking standard. Um, there's a significant reduction in the number of parking spaces on the site. You notice here from the screen um, on the, the photograph at the moment is uh, the footprint reduces the amount of parking available parking on the site. But the highways officers reviewed the application and considered it acceptable. Conditions 22 and 24 of the permission restrict the amount of B2 use um, and the addition and pro prohibit any additional floor space for those reasons. Um, there is a loss of residential accommodation um, that has been um, used in the council's projections for future housing delivery, but that's unfortunate uh, but unavoidable. So there's, there's effectively nothing the council can do to force the applicant to bring forward that permission. Um, the only other issue is 24 hour use may um, perceive, be perceived as posing a neighbour amenity impact, but in this case there's adequate separation distance to residents to the north and it is in the context of the background noise from the M4. So subject to uh, conditions relating to landscaping, highways and ecology and a legal agreement to secure employment skills plan and additional um, road changes on Dane Hill, uh, it's recommended for approval. Thank you, Simon. We have just one speaker, Mark Thompson, the agent. Good evening, Mr Thompson. Good evening. Um, I'm an Associate Director from Savile speaking on behalf of the applicant and uh, firstly I'd like to thank the Planning Officers for the professional and welcome to the report and I hope that members will agree with the recommendation and vote to grant planning permission this evening. The application site represents sustainable brownfield land which has been vacant since 2015. The site is in a very poor state and prone to being used by squatters and for criminal activities such as arson and vandalism. The application proposal seeks to transform the site to deliver a high quality industrial logistics development. The new employment youth responds positively to the Cutbush industrial estate and immediate context with predominantly employment use surrounding the site and close proximity to the M4. As the committee report acknowledges, whilst there is an extant residential permission, this is not viable and is considered that the site's location is more appropriate and logical for continued employment use. The development seeks to meet an unmet need for industrial and logistics use in the borough and would contribute approximately four to five million pounds per annum to the economy. It would also generate and support a number of on and off site construction and operational jobs. Equally, once operational, the development would generate business rates of circa 129,000 per annum for the borough. The development itself has been designed with technical input in terms of highways, drainage, noise, landscape, sustainability and ecology. The design delivers a net gain in biodiversity, new native tree and hedge planting across the site, a mix of car, cycle, motorcycle parking, including electric charging points and sustainable drainage. The building design incorporates high quality materials and has been designed to achieve 3M excellence. I would also highlight that the infrastructure and parking requirements have been carefully developed in close collaboration with Council and the Highways Officer. Subject to planning conditions and other controls, the development is acceptable on all technical requirements. The proposals have been subject to public consultation and as noted within the committee report, there have been no objections to the application from the Town Council, Ward members, Council P or local residents. In fact, there's been support from one of the adjacent businesses in Cutbush Court. The development being considered by members is compliant with local and national planning policy in all respects. The fact that there are no objections clearly demonstrates the application's compliance. The Council's committee report concludes that the site is well suited for its proposed use and the derelict nature of the site is in need of redevelopment and that the proposal represents a functional and well-planned outcome for the site. I would like to conclude that the regeneration of this brownfield site with a long history of vacancy and health and safety issues to create new jobs, meet the needs of the local economy, improve the site's appearance and safety, contribute to biodiversity and respond positively to, that, to climate change to be supported. Thank you for your time. Thank you, members. Uh, Andrew, your local member, I think. Yes, thank you, Chair, and also Simon and Mark for your presentations. Um, there are many reasons why it would be wonderful if this site could be brought back into use and these proposals, your proposals, have many merits. 
including, for instance, the Bre new building's BREEAM excellent rating and local job creation. I do have uh, three um, brief questions and um, points to, to raise. Um, I note that if granted the application would allow for 24 hour use. Um, I'd just like a little bit of clarification on what um, I, I, I'm wondering whether there is a discrepancy on page 261. It suggested that of the 12 projected HGV movements, only two would be night time. But on page 263, that there may be seven two-way HG, uh, HGV movements each evening between 8 and 9 p.m. I fully appreciate the benefits of scheduling deliveries outside peak hours, but I'm just a little worried um, that a concentration of HGV traffic in the evening might impact on neighbourhood amenity. However, uh, the most likely route that these vehicles would be take, uh, taking, um, I appreciate, um, uh, goes past very, very small number um, of homes um, uh, indeed. Uh, but I'd just like some, clari um, some clarification on the numbers and timings of HGV um, movements. Um, I'm also very pleased uh, to see considerations already been given to ensuring road safety in Dane Hill. But I also wonder if highways officers have considered the impacts on road safety on Cutbush Lane, where speeding is quite common and where there are very often learner drivers um, to be found practicing. Given that um, uh, the officer report um, uh, uh, specifically includes references um, uh, to yellow lines, provision of yellow lines um, in Dane Hill, I'm wondering um, whether perhaps some parking restrictions on Cutbush Lane near to Dane Hill could also be included and operational before the new buildings are occupied. Um, finally, um, this is, it's really a very sustainable site, I think, in my view. Anyway, it's got very good connectivity. So I accept that the number um, of parking spaces provided is likely to be sufficient given the nature of um, you know, the proposed business. I would not, however, like to see an increase in demand for on-street parking. Should, for instance, there be a change in the way the building is being used or increased staffing levels? Is it possible to have any reassurances that any future changes to the site that could lead to more on-street um, parking would require um, um, a, a new planning application? I'm not talking necessarily about a change in land use, um, uh, but um, changes in the way in which the proposed buildings might be used, retaining the, um, you know, the agreed land use, but might still have impacts on, on road parking. The reason for raising this, as I say, is that parking within Dane Hill is already a, um, a significant issue and on street parking in Cutbush Lane in particular, I think um, uh, is something which we would not wish to um, uh, to happen for safety reasons. Uh, Simon, those three separate points there. So just, just to pick up on the parking, um, if you want me just to jump in, Simon. Um, so in relation to the site, you probably see that obviously there is a split between um, the, the land uses of uh, B2 and B8. So the condition 22 has been set to limit the land use. Um, therefore, it complies with the parking of the council, the standards that the council sets out, um, and therefore it's not envisaged. And obviously, you know, we can't anticipate that parking will happen out on the road. There is proposals uh, for funding to be secured to obviously implement the traffic regulation order for the yellow lines. They won't be necessarily, uh, this planning consent obviously can't secure that because it has to go through a separate process, but obviously they've agreed to, to fund the implementation of that measure if that should take place. And I think as you get further out then, you know, we, we the parking meets the requirements for on-site uh, and, and as say condition 27 limits that because if you had more of one or more of the other, then it could balance it. So it's it's limiting it 55% maximum gives us the, the, the level of parking that complies with the spaces they provided. Uh, and we don't see it uh, falling out into Danes Hill and, and definitely not out to Cutbush Lane, which is much well, not much further on, but it's further on. Okay, Andrew. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, 
I think I'm being a little bit dull and I do apologise. Um, but is there any opportunity for us to um, um, uh, to seek an informative asking for um, highways to investigate the possibility uh, to to uh, to see, to to uh, to begin the process um, of applying for traffic regulation orders on a smallish section of Cut Bush Lane um, to be implemented before the um, building is occupied. I understand it's a different process, um, but it is a significant safety concern. And if we could do anything, you know, to uh, to help to mitigate this, um, you know, I, I think we should. Thank you. Sorry, just just to understand, what's the safety concern you're referring to? Vehicles parking Pubbish Lane? Yeah, it, it's it's um, the nature of that section of Cutbush Lane is that it, there is frequently speeding. I think Pauline is nodding vigorously, <laughs> and you know would confirm uh, confirm that. Um, we also have had pre-COVID. Um, um, uh, the community speed watch, um, you know, recording, um, um, you know, these these concerns. Now, it's it's um, an additional uh, factor here is that for um, it's a fact uh, that that section of Cutbush Lane um, seems to get particularly heavy use for learner drivers. I don't know why. Okay, um, um, but that does add significantly to our safety concerns. My concern would be particularly if there was parking on Cutbush Lane close to Dane Hill. Dane Hill is a road, the name of a road. So if it was close to that junction, um, uh, I would be particularly concerned um, uh, that HGV drivers may find that their visibility you know, is restricted also potentially their their ability to turn into um, um, cut bush lane uh, safely um, you know um, uh, could be a factor um, and I can't emphasize as this yet you know, we don't know of course what might happen may or may not happen in the future to the number of learner drivers using that area but it is quite significant um, you know at at the moment. So. I, I kind of get that. I, I can't really secure against a planning application for a business use to consider the use of learner drivers, which can use the, any part of public highway. Um, and I think my understanding from looking at the junction arrangements that the you know if they follow the highway code, they shouldn't be parking in close proximity to a junction. Um, uh, it is something that perhaps the highways, if there's a speeding issue already, then I don't know if that's already been reported to the highways team that would look after the existing part of the highway network. Uh, I mean, user, a load of drivers would typically cause a bit of a, a, a slowness on the road, so they would hopefully help to reduce the speed limit if they're out there manoeuvring frequently. Um, and likewise, uh, the auto trader house hasn't been used for or occupied for a period, a period of time. So obviously by increasing that's use and having frequent people moving to and fro will increase the, like you know typically we find that on roads if they're quiet yes speeds do increase if there are more frequent users then it tends to kind of reduce the and help to reduce the speeds uh, by having more vehicles on it um as i say i think uh, the 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 money that to the identified monies in this application to help with the traffic regulation order are for the parking on the uh, on the the road directly outside but as I say, it's not a matter of, of, of parking. I, I don't believe, unless Simon can can know something more, that we could secure any any works further out from this application site um, for highway improvements from this scheme, as it's not none of those have been identified to um, trigger the concern you've got. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just wondering whether, rather than um, you know, seeking this to be conditioned, and I understand your arguments, reasoning why you know um, uh, you would uh, 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 would advise against that. So, I, yeah, I, I've accepted that. But I'm just wondering whether we should um, consider an informative to WBC um, officers. Um, um, you know that we would wish um, you know them to investigate um, uh, the need. You know, for um, for yellow lines, 
close to the junction on Cutbush Lane, close to the junction, you know, of Dane Hill. Uh, uh, yeah. They they would know exactly, you know, what, um, you know, what would be appropriate or inappropriate. And of course, we'd, I would, you know, totally accept that. So an affirmative yeah. to I, go to WBC offices. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think we can put an informative on the application for ourselves because it's not us, but I think okay. uh, we can minute it and that could be taken away. And I'm guessing, as you've mentioned, there's a community police watch were on site previously, then it's something, it's an area that perhaps is known to the council. Um, so I can raise that if we put it in our minutes, then I'll raise that with our traffic management team for them to, to look at it. Perfect, thank you, I'm happy. Great, thank you. Uh, I see no more else oh. wishing to... Sorry, I was just gonna jump in quickly oh, in the first question. Um, the discrepancy or the alleged discrepancy in the HGB movements. One is a, an assessment against the uh, acoustic impact based on an assumption. Um, the other is um, the traffic impact based on tricks calculations. Neither of them are suggesting that that's the actual amount of HG movements that they were, would be occurring on site. Um, but there is a condition, condition uh, 17, does require delivery in logistics plan prior to occupation. So that's when we'll have more detail as to the end user and what kind of movements there will be. But it's not anticipated that, that the conclusions that, that have been reached would alter based on anything that would come forward in that condition. Uh, thank you, Simon. Pauline. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, firstly, I completely agree with Andrew about the WO lines around the corners. And, and down Cutbush Lane at the moment, it is quite a dangerous road. There is a mixture of speeding. Um, I wouldn't like to see people trying to overtake whilst going down there either, to be perfectly honest. The advantage of a WO line is we can enforce it. If it's parking on a corner, the only people who can enforce it are the police, and they probably won't. So I would be very keen to see that go forward as well. Um, I Just to come back on the point that was made earlier about lorries, that bothers me a bit, especially 24 by 7. We're saying Dane Hill is not a residential area, and that's quite true. But you're passing houses going down Cutbush Lane to go towards the M4. And I wouldn't like to see large lorries going regularly past those houses 24 hours a day. So I don't know if we can get any sort of assurance from the officers about the volume and size of vehicles. The other thing, I wouldn't want them coming out of Dane Hill and turning right either because that is very residential down that way. So if you turn left, you pass, I don't know, 20 houses, something like that, and that's bad enough. If you turn right, you're going into developed houses, houses on the road, um, and, and a lot more people. So I don't know if it's possible to put a restriction on lorries to stop them going to the right and only allow them to go to the left. And I would like to see whether there's any possibility of restricting the size and volume of lorries. Um, the view was that restrictions of that nature weren't necessary because of the background noise level of the M4 and the movements on the M4 in the lower early way. Um, the connection to the M4 is to the left uh, or to the west, so it's not anticipated that there'd be any significant movements to the east or to the right. Um, so council officers don't think there is a concern in terms of the, the overall impact. Um, they did submit a pre-application where this, this this issue was discussed. They don't have an end user, um, but it's not anticipated that there'll be predominant overnight use. Um, it would be relatively low use. Majority of the, the um, operation of the site will be during the day as per any other standard, and standard warehouse development. Uh, uh, it is not anticipated, gives me no comfort whatsoever. Um, the 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 noise from the M4 and the eighth and the Lower Early Peripheral Road would affect the building, but the route for the lorries is on the other side of the building and close to houses. I'm very familiar with the noise along there. I cycle along there a lot. I know exactly what it's like. Um, I don't buy the oh well you won't notice for the M4. In between the M4 and that road are trees, are other buildings are a lot of acoustic baffling. The noise down that road is not as bad as it would be if you had an HGV going down there every 10 minutes. Um, I I don't, don't agree. I don't know, I'm not meant to not agree because I'm not meant to know what I'm talking about, but I do know that road very well. And I would be worried about 
too many very large vehicles late at night. Okay. Um, the, as a hypothesis, there's five loading bays to the, um, to the rear of the building. Um, the turnover of, of, of an HGV on the site would be, I'm, I'm guessing, maybe an hour. Um, the number of trip movements that have been used in the assessment for the acoustic assessment um, is very low across the, the the overnight period. So if we're dealing with um, six or seven movements over overnight period, over an eight or nine hour period, then I don't think in, the, in my view that that is a significant impact um, when considered against the existing traffic levels overnight. But if, if I understand you correctly, the acoustic assessment's probably been done on the building, not on people who have left the building who are now driving to the motorway. Is that right? Or have you actually acoustically assessed the entire route to the... No, uh, yeah, you're correct. Yeah. And I, that's the bother. I'm not bothered about the building. The building's fine. My worry is when the, when the lorries come out of that building, and presuming they're not allowed to turn right, and I think we should still restrict that. I'll have a word with highways about that separately. But... If they turn left, they are still going past residential houses and the noise impact on them will be high and they are not as close to either the M4 or the A3, or the uh, B33, whatever it is, the peripheral road uh, as as the building is. And therefore, the the current ambient noise level is lower and the impact will be higher. Yeah. And I don't think you've modelled that. Yeah, that you're correct in what you're saying there, but what I'm suggesting is that in my report, I have taken account of, of traffic levels on surrounding roads arising from uh, this development and that impact, and I found that to be, accept in my view, acceptable. And the environmental health officer has found the same. Do you want to propose a refusal? Or? No, I don't want to propose a refusal. I want somebody to find me some protection for the residents with those with the, the large number of vehicles going potentially going past. Whether we can limit vehicles, whether we can limit vehicle size, I don't know, but I would like some help with that. Um, I, I, I guess we could work at limiting, a, a condition limiting the number of overnight movements or within the scope of the delivery, delivery logistics plan, um, giving an undertaking to the committee to, to work with that condition in terms of reaching a, an appropriate outcome by the chair, maybe, I'm not sure. Do you want to talk to me then offline? Yes, local member. OK, can we go to the recommendation then? Uh, can you give me a minute there? Please. Give me a minute. That's, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, recommendation on page 242, then nothing in the supplementary planning agenda. So those in favour of approving this application, please. And that's unanimous. Yes. Thank you. On to the last one, which is Evidence Ward, Mulberry, Indigo House, Mulberry Business Park, 213975, page 279. And Andrew Chug, who's waited an awfully long time. So good evening, Andrew. Hope you're still awake. Uh, yes, just about. Thank you very much. Um, bear me a second. I'll just share my screen. Riveting meeting. Application 213975 at Indigo House, Mulberry Business Park, is a full planning application for removal of the existing roof and erection of a new second floor to provide 11, one and two bedroom apartments, together with cycle parking facilities and a refuge store. Principle of converting the office building to residential flats has already been established uh, by the extant prior approval decision 210166. And if this latest application is approved, both schemes would be implemented simultaneously to deliver a total of 31 flats uh, within this building. Several other office buildings in the vicinity have gained prior approval for conversion into residential flats under the class O the general permitted development order in recent years. The proposal includes four affordable housing units, 36% of the overall scheme, that will be secured via a legal agreement 
under the section 106 and the application is therefore policy compliant in terms of delivering affordable housing in the borough. In design terms, the proposal would remove the existing shallow pitch roof and replace it with an additional floor would be set back from the elevations and have a lightweight appearance being surrounded by glazed roof terraces. The new second floor would be approximately 1.5 meter lower in height than the roof ridge height of the existing building. The additional floor proposed would not be out of character with the surrounding buildings in the area and be, would, would be reflective of other nearby approvals to add additional residential floors as part of the office to residential conversions. There would be no impact on existing trees and the condition is recommended to secure uh, detail of soft and hard landscaping. Hence, overall, the proposal would enhance the character of the original building and that of the surrounding area. <clears throat> no gardens are proposed for the flats as part of this application. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, private roof terraces would be provided for each unit as outlined on page 293 of the main agenda. Leslie Sears playing ground is walking distance away from the site uh, and it's also in relative close proximity to the town centre and its facilities and open spaces. Those flats would comply with nationally described space standards and the proposal would not have an adverse impact on protected species. Car parking provision would exceed the council standards and adequate cycle parking facilities would be accommodated on site. And the proposal would protect the amenities of future occupants within this and other neighbouring buildings by virtue of uh, acceptable separation distances shown here. Hence, subject to a legal agreement and the conditions set out in the officer report, this approval is rec uh, this application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. No speakers. No local member. Anyone wish to speak? Yeah, Sam. Thank you. Um, yeah, it looks all straightforward. Just it was just only a quick comment regarding the roof terrace. Just be interested to to know whether there could be potential to put some extra green planting or some sort of bio garden type type situation where you could have some sort of wildlife bees or that sort of you know nice things on the roof. Just wanted to know if that was possible. Uh, yes, the condition is recommended for hard and soft landscaping um, that that could be included within that. Um, that's something certainly I guess we could look at. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else wish to speak? Sure. Rochelle. Would they also be willing to possibly put in a gate to Leslie Sears Park so they could have a, access from the back of their house there? Uh, into a already established park as opposed to trying to put it on the roof. I don't know how safe it will be on the roof if they have children walking around and things like that and how well the edges would be and things like that. It could be unsafe. Leslie Sears Park might be a lot cheaper to do uh, rather than a roof garden, but roof garden would be nice for planting to, as far as ecology goes, but I'm not quite sure how much they want to actually stand up there and look out at a business park. Uh, sorry. Certainly you that to, you want, uh, that would not be an informative to ask him to put in a gate to the park instead or with in addition. To consider. You can't. To consider. Request. Consider. Whatever you'd like to put in there, just put forward. Request. Shall we have a vote on which verb we want to use? Right. Everybody happy with that informative? Mm -hmm. Put the hand up. That way. Oh, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Just one small point, if I might raise. Jim, and I see there's a provision for bikes. I can't remember from the original application for this whether there was a, a store and proper protection of uh, rubbish storage. It's a bin storage, man. Bin, bins for rubbish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
That was a question for you, Andrew. Um, the original, I mean, I guess you're referring to the prior approval application. Um, I'm not sure I'd have to refer back to the original decision, but um, certainly uh, there is scope for cycle storage um, as part of this application. That's detailed on the proposed site plan uh, with conditions to secure the detail. So I'll just leave it with you to just look that there is proper storage for, for, for waste. I'm sure we would have covered it last time, but just to be sure. Thank you. Nobody else wishes to speak. Pardon, Bill? Just a question. Yep. Very quick. Uh, I'll, bit, I'll flick through it. I just can't see any provision for electric vehicle charging. Is that actually mentioned or not? Somewhere um, uh, just checking, sorry, two seconds. Need more respect for officers. Is there a lift as well in the building? That was the other question I meant to ask. There is no lift, no lift in the building, no. It would be an internal staircase. Uh, I don't believe that we've got uh, details of uh, electric vehicle charging point on this one as such. We can add. Informative. Yeah, informative. Yeah. Yeah. You want an informative? Yeah, as an informative. Yes. Can we? I'll second your informative. I'll, I'll second his informative. We need a second. Everybody happy with the informative to encourage request, etc. Electric charging points. Well, don't blame me. Um, OK, that's agreed. I've decided. So the recommendation on 280 page. Those in favour of approving this application, please show if that's unanimous. Um, Jeff Marcy is here. Just anybody want to talk about the end? I don't know what this last page is doing here. And the, End of this supplementary planning. Well, what does it say? What they? Yes. I'm closing the meeting there. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>